Wie geht's, mein Freund? Is that coming through? Yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. there. Awesome, here he is. <laughs> Uh, very sorry, uh, I, I sent you the wrong link. It was broken yeah, no just on Facebook or whatever. So, but we have yeah, you here. I'm using my laptop, but we got a bigger screen here so I can okay. see everybody. So, are we from everywhere around the world? <laughs> yeah, probably. A How lot many of are Canadian? Any a lot Canadian? of Americans, that's for sure. <laughs> I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, we go, we go. Uh, I, I'm Canadian. I'm both. <laughs> I play it safe. I can see nice. Canada from my rear mirror. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing how damn gray I am. What the hell? <laughs> Where are you uh, from? That happens. <laughs> and it's happening every day. Uh, yeah. Well, my name's Ken, and I was uh, raised by a Navy dad pilot. So I grew up, um, I was born in the Bay Area, California. I lived in Whidbey Island, Washington, a Kodiak, Alaska, Corpus Christi, Texas, Monterey, California, back to the Bay, to Hawaii. I lived in Hawaii from 68, just before summer, 68, till uh, the end of 70. And that's where I got started absorbing Hawaiian music. And it hadn't really, you know, had the renaissance, they call it, yet. So, uh, you know, we had to really dig to find records and stuff like that. We got to meet some of the old timers, which was really cool. Yeah. But my, you know, my dad had this tremendous record collection. And, you know, as a kid, man, he just absorbing all that stuff, you know? And my mom played uke, you know, it was a popular thing in the 30s. So she she played with her twin sister. So we had the uke in the house, and then we had some stuff from my grandfather. There was a zither in the house, <laughs> a really old one, and a mandolin. So the string instruments were there, right? So that's, you know, as a kid, the uke was the perfect instrument to start on, you know. <laughs> And then so later on, and like around, I was born in 53, so around 1960, I guess my dad thought maybe we, because we, he played piano as, you know, younger. So he thought rather than drag a piano in and out if we didn't get into it, they gave us accordion lessons. <laughs> and, you know, back, in, back then there wasn't any Flaco Jimenez or Tex-Mex or anything hip, right? It was all Lawrence Welk, basically, you know. So, you know, I really wasn't interested in that. So then they, uh, I took cornet lessons for a while. <laughs> that wasn't really happening. And so they, he kind of gave up, you know, and then, you know, we had the uke there, right? So he was flying to Japan and the Orient and back and forth. So he brought one guitar back and that was it, man. It was like, oh, I guess they're guitar players because we were, you know, basically fought over that thing. So. His next trip, he brought two more back, so there were three guitars in the house. Yeah, so that's what launched me, you know. But, you know, I was thinking the other day that uh, it was I was sort of fortunate to start early enough because it was pre-Beatles. You know how the Beatles changed everything, right? Everybody wanted an electric guitar and all that, but just before that, you know, it was still the folk thing and you know, my older brother and sister played all that Sippy Wallace stuff and all the Dylan, you know, and that thing, you know. But I, I, I like that because I was playing acoustic guitar before the Beatles hit, you know, so I was already starting to finger pick and, you know, so that was a real uh, sort of a template or a basis for me to become an acoustic guitarist, which, you know, I play electric, but I mean, I, I appreciate that time because I learned how to finger pick before the, you know, the rock and roll thing, you know, because I was like all the other kids at that time. I got my, I think it was a Wards or a Sears, <laughs> right? One of those funky electric guitars and the little amp, you know? Yeah. So. Now my whole steel thing is a trip, you know, I, 
I was a real blues fan, you know, as a young teen, and I, I listened to a lot of guys. And, and then when Johnny Winter came along, you know, around 68, 69, you know, somebody said, listen to this guy, man, he's a white guy playing the blues. And I go, white? Hell, he's an albino. <laughs> 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 you can't get more white. <laughs> but, you know, that slide. So I, I immediately started playing bottleneck, you know. And uh, meanwhile, we had all these records that my dad had. He had 78s and then the 33s, right? Well, the 78s, you know, he let us play them, right? So we got into those things and there were Hawaiian records, you know, Genoa Keave and stuff. So I was hearing that still, you know, going, that's pretty cool, you know? Well, as fate would have it, um, there was somebody moving in the neighborhood and one of my friends came over and said, hey, there's this sweat square guitar case in the basement and they moved everything out, but they left it there. They go, you want to come look at it? So I go, sure. So I went there and it was an old Gibson, uh, uh, lap steel, right? And I said, wow, this is kind of cool. And they go, well, do you want it? <laughs> so that's kind of like fate dropping a steel into my hands, literally, you know? So yeah, that's what launched me off, man. And then I just started messing around with it. And then of course, you know, we moved to Hawaii and that really kicked it all off for me. So that's kind of lucky I got in, got in a little early. Yeah. You met a lot of great players uh, in Hawaii, right? Oh, man. Well, you know, I was real lucky because, uh, you know, nobody had really mined it, you know? I mean, some of these guys are still around and nobody cared. I, I would go down to Waikiki and I would talk to these old time, they were beach boys. And they were, some of those guys are part of a, a group called the Waikiki Stonewall Boys. And they actually recorded, you know, on 78s. So, yeah, so I just started looking up who was still around, you know, and my brother and I. And, uh, man, you know, uh, they were kind of surprised that these two young Howley guys were interested in what they did back in the 20s and 30s, you know. So, actually, that's how I ended up getting a gig with Saul Bright, and I ended up working with Saul K. Bright, one of my heroes, you know. It was incredible. Yeah. Yeah, those guys, man, I tell you, they were classic. They were, man, they were so funny. And, you know, I had been collecting stuff already. I went to college in Santa Cruz in the early 70s and mid 70s, ran into Bob Rosman. That was the first time. And, you know, we were both uh, hounds at the flea market collecting stuff. And we were, there was kind of a rivalry on our collecting, you know, we had to get there earlier and earlier, see each other down the row, you know, hey, Bob. <laughs> But I found some cool stuff at that Santa Cruz flea market. And then I was able to, you know, show it to Saul Bright later on. And I go, hey, Saul, look at this. It was a union book from L.A., from the Musicians Union in 1930. <laughs> so, I, so, I had, so I brought, I used to go to visit Saul at his little apartment on Ennis Street. And uh, right, right near the ocean in Waikiki. And I, I bring this stuff and he just got a kick out of it. And I go, hey, where did you get this stuff? I go, oh, it's just been collecting it you know so i brought the union book over and man i got a whole story about i go so i go you're in here but i go look all of the hawaiians if you go to the k's and the h's and the a's and, and you find their names in there they, they all have the same street address what's up with that and he goes we all commandeered this hotel and we all live there <laughs> so all the hawaiians were living in one place at one time doing all their uh LA stuff yeah pretty pretty cool wow. but he got a kick out of it I bring the national over and we go oh man I go so you you were marvelous on this instrument man he hadn't seen one in a while yeah I got this cheap Weisenborn copy to travel with these things are kind of cool that's tuned to Sebastopol isn't it Go to a, a sixth, yeah. You know, 
What was it Les Paul was talking about? You'll never figure everything out on a guitar. And he was 90. <laughs> he says, you're never going to, it's, it's, it's just going to go on forever. You keep discovering things, you know. And boy, was he right about that, man. You know. I like to something. You ever do this, you guys? You ever just come up with some strange tuning and just try it, you know? And yeah, you can get some really cool stuff that way, you know? What I need to do is go through all these recordings I did uh, when I was living on Kauai. You know, it's all on, it was, you know, you know, back in the 90s and stuff, you're trying to save stuff, you know? So I've got a boxes of DAT tapes and CDs and, you know, ADATs and <laughs> all this stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna need to force myself to go through all this stuff because I know there's a lot of music in there that I recorded. Yeah. And I was gonna ask you, did you invent that G6 tuning or was that- I didn't invent else? it, but you know what? I really haven't heard too many people using it, which is surprising, you know? But that, that G6, um, man, that thing works for, you know, I'll use it in low bass tuning because you still get the effect. But when whenever you play a electric lap steel, you know, and you got the high bass G, man, it's just great for that. You know, you tune that middle D up to, to E. So what is it then? It's G, B, E, G, B, D. Man, you can do so much stuff. It's great for swing, you know. It's great for all that 1930s jazzy, swingy stuff. Man, it's just... And, you know, you, you get all these really cool slants with the bass strings as well as the, uh, the um, you know, going on the other top end of it. Yeah, it's very cool. Is there a lap steel here? Mm -hmm. This is our, this is the uke house. Was that a tuning that you just stumbled on or was that something that you learned from somebody? I stumbled on it. You know how you got that straight, even high bass G? It's, that's very utilitarian to me. It's like, wow, that thing is great and all, but it's, it's like a, it's like a platform. It's like, it needs a twist. So, you know, when you flatten the G to F sharp, then you get that, you know. But when I tune the, to, to the, uh, D up to E, it was like, okay, this is it, man. This is like a, the greatest variation. It just changes the whole thing and it's one string, you know? And you can actually use it with that flattened G with the F sharp. So it'd be G, G, B, E, F sharp, B, D. <laughs> yeah. Cindy Cashdolly uses that tuning for Western uh, swing stuff like Panhandle Rag. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I never met her all the years. I never did meet her. Huh. Did you just say you used it on a low bass tuning? Yeah. As well. Yeah. Let me, so you have a D that. on the bottom. Let me show you what I mean. I don't know if this is pitch. It's not going to be in pitch, but. Play the 
open the strings, you can pull back the bar. That's three, three back. Kind of a nice sound. Funny roulette. <laughs> you guys ever hear Freddie Roulette? Man, that guy. I don't think he ever held the bar, you know, straight across a fret, that guy. He was always just, I, you know, Freddie Roulette was like from another planet to me. <laughs> and I luckily got to tour with him. But man, that guy, he was pretty loose, you know, but man, he, he made it work somehow. <laughs> Not sure of his tuning. I tried to figure it out. He had he had some lighter gauge strings on the on the bottom, and stuff tuned up. And I didn't even bother. It, I didn't even bother to try and figure it out. <laughs> yeah, you guys like Feet Rogers? Sure. Man, that guy is such a touch. You know. Luckily, I got to hang and meet him and hang out with him. He busted me one time. My brother and I had a gig at the Blue Dolphin Room in Waikiki. And uh, the Sons of Hawaii were doing a, a, a couple of nights there during the week. And we had, we had a happy hour gig. It was early in the day. And, uh, you know, the, the, the little stage there had a curtain in front, right? And I went to put something away, and there was Feet's guitar. His, his Rickenbacker. I'm like, oh, man. You know, <laughs> this is how fate works. So I'm thinking, oh, it's early in the day. He, we wouldn't mind. So I pull it out. I open up the case and I'm just about to, I got my ear down to it because it's not plugged in, right? <laughs> and I go, to, I, <laughs> I go to strum across to get that tuning and I feel this tap on my shoulder <laughs> and I turn around and it's feet. <laughs> oh God, I just put it away. Forget it, feet. I, I didn't want to know. Beat so Rogers so which out. which tuning did he use? He he was using D tuning, right? Like everybody says. Yeah, it's like a, if you do a D chord on a guitar, that you know that pattern. He had that on the top, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> somebody, I'm sure somebody figured it out. So I guess that's probably the guitar that Bobby Gano's got now, right? Huh? No feet. Got a couple of Feet's guitars, and Fred unfortunately passed away. And I think uh, Feet has one. Or Bobby has. One. Yeah, Bobby's I was just texting with him. He might. Um, he's gonna. He's trying to log in. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, he may hop on in a minute. No. Nobody's got beats touch with harmonics. So, you know, uh, I don't even play that tuning, but I just noticed I just did that forward slant. So right off the bat, there's all these voices, yeah? Yeah, then you get the... Try this tuning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that Pascal? Pascal? Bonsoir, monsieur. Comment allez-vous? Good to see you. Yeah. Hey, Ken, yeah. how do you keep all this, all these tunings in your head? You know, do you have any, t any tips for not losing your mind? I, you when know what I think you... helped was that I played a lot of bottleneck and blues and stuff. So I, you know, I do, a, you know, Sebastopol and variations of G and yeah. Um, but, you know, for steel, I'd probably stick basically to high bass G on the lap guitars and I'll do the F sharp or the six. The national, it's all straight. I like straight G because, as I was explaining to Sebastian, I do a slack steel thing that 
I didn't invent it really, but you know what? No one's really developed it. I mean, I heard it in Connie and Lula, you know, and even Brosman did a, a version of it, but it wasn't quite right, you know, and I play a lot of slack key. So I, you know, I've really developed this, um, you know, the trick is you have to, you have to have the bar, <laughs> you know, you're so used to playing and chords and all the way across, you gotta use the, the end of the bar, you know, a lot, because you gotta be able to sound the bass strings. So I, basically what I did was I took the right hand of the slack key and the left hand of the steel and I put them together, you know, but it's pretty cool, it's like a, steady bass and you know you get the you do get deep uh, notes and you're playing all that high stuff off the top you know it's pretty cool so uh that's the slack steel style but you know the nationals man god you know when i first started recording with them i had a couple of mics on it and i'm just going this thing is like from 1928 and it's a stereo guitar it's like so advanced you know because it's got those two cones and then the the single other cone on the other side and the sound does really literally travel across there yeah yeah when i first discovered the nationals you know they they were they weren't cheap back in the early 70s mid 70s they were they were quite expensive you know bobby Hey, no more. <laughs> you get him. <laughs> hey, you look like a Himalayan with that hat, bro. <laughs> uh, Bobby and Ghana, what a great guy. Where are you going? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'll ask a question, Ken, if that's cool. Um, sure. Um, any like Hawaiian records that you really influenced you and set you off that stand out in your mind? Oh God, yeah. Um, in fact, speaking of Saul, I, you know, I was finding these seventy-eights back then for like a dime a piece. <laughs> I'd pay twenty-five cents, you know, if it was real clean, you know. I was, but uh, you know, uh, Saul did. Um, on a national, he did um, He Ono. Man, that, that was some solid, great playing. And uh, of course, um, Benny Nawahi, God, you know, you hear that guy the first time you go, man, these guys are, <laughs> these guys are happening. And, you know, and of course, I, I, I found some great uh, Saul Ho'opiti records. And then the reissues started coming out, you know, uh, on uh, Arhuli or whatever, the, you know, some of those labels. And, and that's when I met, you know, uh, Robert Armstrong, the, the Cheap Suit Serenader. So then it was like, all right, there's these guys doing it in California. So, uh, yeah, so you just start, you'd find a guy that knew a little more than you because it's all discovering, you know, I was laughing about, with, with Sebastian, you know, he can go on the internet and bang. <laughs> back back in the day, man, we'd be, you know, out there just in uh, 
flea markets and uh, you know antique stores, antique stores, finding the records and the stuff. You had to literally go out and find them yourself, you know. But yeah, the Saul the Saul Ho'opi'i ones are great. Um, and you know, I man, you'd, you'd luck out and find some that were just so totally clean, you know, and take them home and play them. And uh, I heard uh, Saul do that singing the blues, and I knew right away, you know, these guys were listening to Dick's Biterback, you know, they were listening to Louis Armstrong, because that was the popular music of the time for jazz, you know. So they were playing their favorite guys, and they were converting them to steel. And I'm thinking, wow, well, how hip is that, man? So yeah, that really inspired me to to attempt it, you know. But you had to figure out the techniques, you know. It's like, how did he, how the hell did he do that, you know? Like the first time I I would try, I would try triplets, at, you know. I would do it with two fingers. I would fake it, but I'm like, that ain't right, you know. So. Once you figure out how to go with your thumb and follow with two fingers, you had it. Then you could just. Hmm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like it was just um, unlocking these little secrets, you know, really, really fun. And of course, you know, chording. I mean, to me, it's like, you know, I like doing single note licks and all that stuff, you know, the hot stuff. But, you know, Saul was a master. They do those like, uh, what is it, Nali'i or when, you know, it goes. <laughs> you know, the chord stuff is totally hip to me. So I, I really love doing that. And I would just find... My whole key to, to the way that I practiced when I was younger was I would learn like in C. I would just figure out, okay, you got the low position is that radical slant at the bottom, which is really cool. Now that one, you can still play three strings. That's cleaner, but. Those are nice voices, you know. And then you can, yeah, what I like to do is when you flip to the, you would go to the seventh, right? So you go. <laughs> or half steps with a C. I guess you can try to go further, you need a longer bar. Yeah, I would uh, take the slant. When you get to that real radical first part, then you just hold, then slide the whole thing down a half step. Stuff like that, you know, it's like, I, I love the chord stuff. I really do. And can I, can I, uh, I've noticed you do some really cool, dissonant, purposely dissonant kind of licks yeah. in Hawaiian music, almost bluesy stuff, where you really like lean into that dissonant. Yeah, yeah. Really cool stuff. Yeah, and that's that's the thing about the national with the bass strings. You know, that's why I love the Kalama Quartet. You know, you know what? A lot of that stuff hasn't been mined. I, I don't think, you know, that's why I told Sebastian, I go, hey man, you know, we too could really do some stuff because Kalama did that, you know, and when one's playing high, the other one's low, and you can get like these killer uh like a uh, trombone parts you know he, when he uh, on the blues he's a you know slide up yeah and then you know i don't know once again it's back to that thing about les paul it's like you know the possibilities are like ah just uh, they're endless, man. And you know, also like when when Saul did those, like I like that. Uh, yeah. 
throw the triplets in, you know, you do the same lick. You know. Rosman did a lot of that stuff. But Saul, you know, his touch and his feeling is like, you know, when he would do that, just that sweet, you know, from the national. You know, that radio blues, man, it's like, oh, the way he, he, he releases here and there and does these sweet little. Uh, Sebastian, because you know, I never pull this thing out, and I this COVID year, it's like I, I mean, I blame myself, but I just haven't been playing, and you know, it, it's really good to get them out. I, I did finally do a gig the other week, though, that was great. I play with the Rowan brothers a lot, you know, all three of them at different, it seems at different times, and a lot with Chris and, and Lauren, and that's great. I I usually end up playing just almost all steel with those guys. Yeah. I got this electric Dobro, you know, one of those uh, cheapo, like I like to get a, I like to have a couple of cheapos on hand to travel with. If they get break, broken or stolen, who cares, right? And some of those, those uh, Oriental, <laughs> I'll call them Oriental, I'll be PC. Uh, some of them are kind of good, you know, and uh, I've got this electric Dobro, kind of like the one that Pascal's got on the wall there. And that thing is, um, is really cool. You know, I've got like super heavy, thick strings on it. And the thing is like, you know, I, don't, I didn't even bother to raise the neck because the strings are so thick and it just kind of the neck came up a bit, you know, it's like, ah, oh, this is great. <laughs> so I can kind of finger it still, but I play it on my lap and I, I'll flip it up and play it, you know, regular and I'll put it on my lap and play it. And uh, uh, I don't know if any of you guys ever heard, uh, know the Bay Area music scene from the 60s, but there was a band called the Ace of Cups. <laughs> what does that say? Oh, it's a Regal. Nice. 1935 Regal. Very cool. Uh, the Ace of Cups band. Um, I got to work on this project with them. It was great. And I, I used that guitar. And uh, man, you know, I mean, I love acoustic, don't get me wrong, but I love playing around with electrics. Because, you know, when I was a kid, man, you know, in the 60s, we all had all the silver tone amps and all that stuff. And uh, so I have this old, um, it's a small, uh, it's a Gresh, it's a Gresh amp from the 60s. And it's got the greatest tremolo in it, you know. No reverb, but this killer tremolo and a small like eight inch speaker. And I, I use it on this session and I kind of drove it up to where it got some kind of gritty sound on that with a tremolo. And uh, that made it onto the album, it's really cool. And um, you know, I'm a real fan of all those guys. And it, it turned out that the other guitar player that played on the track was Yorma Kalkinen from the uh, Jefferson Airplane. <laughs> So that, that was cool, that, that little amp, man, it really made that thing happen. Yeah. I've got, you know, I have much less lap steels than I used to have. I used to, man, you know, cause they were cheap back in the day. I mean, you could get lap steels for 50 bucks all day. You know, it was crazy back in the early seventies. 
Yeah. I have one question. Um, I saw that you were, I'm a big Donald Fagan fan. So I saw you play ah. off the cap. And was that? Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, you do a session for Donald. You, you don't ever think, even if you're like a famous guy, it's like he, they're known for like not using stuff. Right. So I thought, well, this will never happen. And yeah, I ended up on that on that record. That was pretty cool. Yeah, Todd Rungren introduced me to Donald. I had played with Todd some and recorded on a couple of his records. You know, those guys just found me on Kauai. I was playing at the uh, Hanalei Bay Resort. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I have a sort of a track record of playing guitar. I played a lot of blues, you know, and I got hooked up with. Charlie Musselwhite I toured off and on for five years with. Did some tours with Elvin Bishop and, you know, played the festival. So I got to meet all these other guys. And yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's cool to have like a, a um, Hawaiian music career and then you've got your blues career. In fact, now Bobby Ongano is doing that now. He's out with Taj. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah man uh, you know you know bobby plays with taj and taj's drummer is a guy named kester smith he's from grenade he's from the caribbean and man he's got this lilt to his drums that no other blues drummer has you notice that bobby yep kester's playing you know like a lot of guys on a shuffle will go well he goes he takes that whole hi-hat thing and he flips it forward, right? Yeah, it's, it's really so unique. He's, he's, on the he's on the very top of the... It's hard to explain. Yeah, he's yeah. He's double time in it, right? So da -da -da, he's going... Da -da 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 -da. He gets like yeah. a little triplet thing going. It's awesome. No, yeah. nobody, nobody does that. Uh, but, yeah. Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? The, the point is that timing thing. That's all this stuff is, man. You know, with the with the guitar and the steel and you know your licks and your notes, you know, and playing off the, you know, you play off the one, you know, throw it in on the three or, yeah, timing's timing's a th real trip. Oh yeah. <laughs> and if you mess, if you if we would mess up, Taj would give us this look, and, <laughs> <laughs> and we said, <say>, oops. <laughs> I know, you know, I, I recorded on two of Todd Rungren's records, right? And I've hung with the band a lot. And, you know, he's got Prairie Prince, the drummer, the crazy, great band, yeah. you know, and then I've seen some of their gigs, you know, and I'm like, maybe it's a good thing I'm not playing with him because <laughs> he's, pretty, he's pretty hard on them sometimes, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, even Todd. <laughs> yeah. You know. But, yeah, live and learn, man. <laughs> That's it, man. And see the Donald, that's the guy. He's a genius, man. You don't know what the guy's thinking, man. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, Alan Thomas snapped a couple pictures of us in the studio and uh, he's got a keyboard out and I'm sitting in front of it, right? <laughs> and he's playing this chord and you gotta see my face. I'm like, okay, <laughs> what do you call that? Yeah. You know, the thing about the styles of music, you know, I went, I got into this old Hawaiian thing and I played all that 20s and 30s stuff. And, you know, and I played with Mo Keale, I played with some great singers and players and stuff and pretty much did everything you can as far as that. And I was, I was living on Oahu and I had a steady gig at Jermaine's Luau. <laughs> and that was a cool gig because there was a lot of all these old Hawaiian jazz players that were still around then mm. right and uh a vibe we had a vibe player and it was a cool band you know it was really, i really fit into that thing so i was trying to figure out what to do next you know and uh there was a hurricane in 1982 hurricane eva really? and they had a they had a benefit on Kauai, right yeah. So I went, up, I went over there to play the benefit and I met this crazy, crazy uh, stride piano player named David Paquette. And, you know, I knew the music and all that, but when I met this guy, I'll tell you what, that just took me like, 
And I ended up going to New Orleans and I ended up touring with him and it made all these incredible musicians. So what I did in Hawaii, I was able to do in New Orleans. There were still some of the old timers around, you know? And uh, man, they were cool. You know, it's like, I went to the, I went to play the jazz festival there in 1983. And uh, one of those uh, brass bands was marching down the, you know, and playing on a coconut island, you know, all those horns. And I'm like, hey, they're playing Hawaiian songs, man. And so I talked to these guys, I go, oh yeah, you know, Hawaiian songs have been in the repertoire of New Orleans music for a long time. So that was very cool. So, you know, I sort of got, got the national in on that. And I, I had a regular guitar too, and I double on those things. And I got really into traditional jazz and New Orleans jazz for, a, a while and of course you know all that stuff that Saul did and all that just totally fits in the New Orleans music you know yeah. and so I kind of took that I've, I've done stuff like I found these tracks on this album I did in 97 um, called Slack and Steel is the first one yeah and I and I uh, when I, I actually bought my tapes back from John Fujitani Keone Fujitani, I bought my masters back and they were, it was tape, you know? <laughs> and I, uh, when I uh, listened to it, there was other songs on there. There were outtakes that never were on the album. One of them was Wine and Boy Blues by Jelly Roll Morton. And I'm like, hey, this, this thing is good. Why didn't we put it on the record? So when uh, Michael Cord and I reissued that album, we put those extra songs on there. But I, I do that. Why no boy is really cool. It's like uh, if I gotta find it. Kind of like it's a fun style to play. ago I went I got invited to uh, Augusta um this old college in West Virginia and I yeah. met all of these Cajun families. Ah I forgot their names but I know um I sat in with Goldman Thibodeau and all that and they did this oh, what they call this cool. Cajun national anthem was it was uh, written by this lady who this Cajun player who came to Hawaii a long time ago. So they, they, they wanted to know um, how she got the song. So when they played it, it was a mix with um, Maui chimes and <laughs> all the way. And nice. then when they played it to me and I gave them the title, I said, just these two songs. And they <laughs> were jumping for joy, man, because they were trying to find out ever since she went to Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah, the melody yeah. is um, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it makes you wonder, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. all those guys back in the, even back in the 20s and 30s, they all had access to Hawaiian music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the record. So, you know, 
I mean, how many different, um, not just New Orleans or Cajun, but how many other different musicians were, uh, you know, kind of picked oh, up really a few things from that and used it? Cool, all of these guys. Well, you know, the Western swing guys, I mean, you know, they, I don't want to say they owe it all to uh, guys like Dick McIntyre, but man, you know, I'm, I'm sure they were really influenced a lot by the Hawaiian players. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and one of the strangest things I heard one time, I was listening to this, uh, you know, Django with uh, um, Stefan Grappelli, the Hut Club. Yeah, and I was listening to this fast swing song, and right at the end of Stephen's uh, um, violin solo, yeah, I heard a vamp, little, 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 and I, <laughs> really, I freaked out, man. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that from piano players a lot in New Orleans. You know, they play that full on Hawaiian vamp. Ken, I was gonna say your um, that you know what you just played. It really reminds me a lot of Travis picking. Have you seen like some comparison with that? Yeah, that... you know, Travis picking is really good for you. You know, I'm a guitar player and I, I do a lot of finger style stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean, look at, look what, look what like uh, guys like Roy Buchanan and Danny Gatton did on a Telecaster, you know, between the, the picking and the, I mean, there's some crazy stuff, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, I love taking it. You know, I've been kind of bored lately because of COVID. I'm not working. So I started doing a few videos, just throw these short little things up, playing a Les Paul because I got some new amps and I'm trying them out. But um, I want to do one like get a Stratocaster, you know, kind of like take it. I like flipping stuff. Take a Stratocaster, and you know everyone's playing blues and rock, and maybe a little country, but that's about it on that thing. And just full on get on the uh, rhythm pickup and put a little bass on there, and then just do a bunch of Travis picking, you know, and uh, some jazz, your finger style jazz, you know. Yeah. Well, that, I think the story is he got that. that from the blues players, right? And I wonder, I just wonder if that kind of came from more of a Hawaiian sort of thing yeah you know, where that you know and bobby and we we're talking about the cross thing i have a picture of a of a black jazz band from the 30s called the albert ammons i believe was the name of the, of the leader the of that band. The albert, ammons. albert ammons and there's a picture of this the guitar player's got a like a, a fry pan or something next to him and it's a full-on jazz band so you're like <laughs> What did he do on that thing, man? I, don't want to hear I think it. I, I think I seen that picture. Yeah. 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 yeah so now I don't know whether it was like a for a novelty tune, like they'd play a little Hawaiian, but um, well, the you know, but man, it's the greatest jazz instrument, you know, next to a violin because there's no frets, man, and yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, the epitome of all my whole life was. You know, it was like if they asked you when I was a kid or any time, you know, who who would you like to play with, you know? And my always number one was Les Paul. And I, and I I got hooked up and was able to play with Les in New York. And you know what? That was the coolest thing that I've ever done for myself as well as for how it turned out was, you know, all these guys go down there with a the Les Paul and sit in with Les and play, you know, Jazz, blues, rockabilly, something, but it's a guitar, right? So I had this. Um, yeah. I have this EH one hundred and fifty Gibson, you know, with I the Charlie that. Christian pickup, nineteen thirty six, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and and it's got Gibson, all scrolled Gibson on the headstock, and I go, I'm gonna bring this thing because he's <laughs> gonna know, because you know, Randy Onis, this guy, great musician in Hawaii that played Hawaiian music, and he played a. Uh, Clarinet yeah. yeah, Randy, I, I uh, lent him my Les Paul Mary Ford Hawaiian record, and he loved it so much he never gave it back. Right, <laughs> but you know, Paul, Les Paul did that Hawaiian record, so so I, I bring the I bring the uh, live guitar in. He's kind of looking at me like, 
you know? So like, what are we gonna do? He's got this Hawaiian guitar. And I, I'm from Hawaii last, you know, stuff. So we go into the first song and it's Sea Jam Blues, you know, da 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 Real up-tempo jazz thing, you know? And uh, and I had him on the first break, man. I played, I played it, they go, go ahead, you know? And I played the first solo, I played this jazzy solo and did some chord stuff and it was kind of getting up there. And on the set, and so he's kind of like, take another chorus, right? Well, the second chorus, I just went totally um, crazy, you know, and just started doing these crazy, licks and then I do, then I just right in the middle of it started doing chickens and cows and horses and stuff and Les, <laughs> Les, is, <laughs> Les stops playing and he's watching me you know I, I knew I had him man you know I just <laughs> totally went novelty on the guy <laughs> he stopped playing and he goes like this <laughs> I thought man that is the highest honor I've ever had is to be flipped off by Les Paul <laughs> So we finished the tune, you know, and he's all like, where the hell, who the hell are you? Where, where are you from? I go, I'm just some guy from Hawaii. Les. I, go, I go, look, and I hold that thing up on my knee. This is the great, greatest moment. I hold it up on my knee and he sees the Gibson written pre-war, you know. And I go, look, uh, it's a Gibson, Les. And he goes, what year is that? And I go, 1936. And here he is, 90 years old, right? He looks out at the audience without skipping a beat and goes, that was the first year I was thinking of retiring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that guy is something else. The, but, the, yeah. that's, the, that's the best compliment when um, you can get through to the old timers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah you know? And those that's guys, they, they, yeah. they like that's it. They appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, they appreciate it. Yeah. Saul, yeah. Saul did. So, you know, Saul Ho'opi'i um, passed away in 1953, and that was the year I was born. And I, I forget how I got hooked up, but I got hooked up with um, with Saul's, Anna Ho'opi'i, Saul's wife. Yeah, yeah. And we corresponded a lot, and I got a lot of great info from her. And then I was, I was, um, she sent me a letter and said, I'm coming out to Hawaii. So I did a really cool thing. I, I got told these, you know, old timers that were around and Genoa and everybody, I go, Saul's wife's coming out here. So uh, when she came out, I met her in Waikiki and we went out every night and <laughs> <laughs> she saw the greatest, really greatest hula in Hawaiian music. And they really, they really took care of her, man. That was fantastic. But uh, yeah, on a whole P. Yeah, she's she said really she was down to one or two guitars left, and one of them was a Martin. It was a Hawaiian setup Martin, though. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody knows what happened to the rhinestone tricone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wonder what happened to that guitar. Yeah, she's she's uh. She's really kolohe too. Fun, fun to be with. I met her at uh, um, in Winchester, one of those steel festivals. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I introduced myself to her, and she said, "You know what? You remind me of song." <laughs> <laughs> Just by the way, I look and I had my hair parted in the middle. Let's <laughs> 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 have lunch. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, she's, she's really. Uh, um, when I met her, she was in the nineties and, you know, she was yelling at all the, the rest of the steel guitar players, wives who are in the seventies. And she was telling yeah. them, come on, you old farts. You gotta hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's, yeah. She's really strong, man. Well, you know, that got me interested in the Seattle scene and the Seattle scene goes way back, man. Those, those guys play at the Yukon um one of those big uh you know what do you call it like exposition you know and it was in it was before 1910 you know it was before the the big one in san francisco at the palace the palace of fine art you know they had a big fake volcano at that thing this is 1915 <laughs> and they had the pele room they had this giant fake volcano 
But you know, they did present a lot of hula and uh, and uh, you know the bands, and I think K Kuku played. You know. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. That really kicked it off for Hawaiian music. The records were already out there, but that ex exhibition, uh, man, you know, that started the first big Hawaiian music craze. Yeah, definitely. You know, you can go on the Library of Congress site and um, find these um, old newspapers, you know. That's fun to do, man. I got on the San Francisco call and this is before the earthquake. <laughs> so this is pre-1906, right? And it's like, oh, madam, you know, the Hawaiian troop is playing and San Francisco two nights before they steam back to Hawaii, you know, on the ship. It's great. And they play these little theaters and and I had one that was it showed a Hawaiian band and then the other artists for another night was a, a, a bunch of comedy teams. And uh, one of them was the Jolson brothers. You know, Al Jolson must have been really young at that time. Yeah, boy, what, what were those days like, man? Really? I mean, the car was a new thing then, you know, God. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, when, when did uh, Benny pass away? Pass away, you know, Benny King, Hawaii? Yeah, Benny, he lived pretty long. You know, Robert Armstrong got to know him. Yeah. That's there's just a, there's a there's an interview out I think two part interview that uh, Robert Armstrong did with him. Yeah, and uh, it's just I think it was released like uh, a month ago or something. But it's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of yeah, info Robert. like the, the crazy high tuning he used. He used C or even D tuning, like really right. high yeah. pitched, high energy stuff. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, Benny, man. What a player. Yeah, Robert's cool. We did that uh, Escape to Jazz Isle album. But you can't get it here. And it's like it's out of a, on an English label. So I don't even have a copy of it. <laughs> but we did a couple cool things on there. Yeah, he plays the saw too, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's more a, than steel guitar, man. <laughs> <laughs> the saw is like it, it's a it's an acquired taste. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like all the dogs. <laughs> oh, you can't imagine somebody playing that today in Hawaii music. Yeah, well, you know what? It's funny. There's a guy named uh, Tom Scribner. And he played on the mall, uh, Pacific Avenue, out busking out there in Santa Cruz when I was going to college there. And I met this guy and I'm like, hey, I play steel guitar. So he goes, come on down there. So, and he was already in his eighties, right? This is in like 1974 or something. So uh, I bring an acoustic down there and, and man, the guy knew all these Hawaiian songs. I learned a bunch of Hawaiian songs from a saw player. <laughs> that's that doesn't happen too often but tom was great they, they built a little statue to that guy yeah and boy he was a card carrying communist man he had his little red book <laughs> he was old school yeah you know when you tom. think about it when you think about it when you find out all these things you know people been sharing music since day one man absolutely you know? Yeah, because you hear all kinds of uh, influences, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, no doubt there was a Neanderthal that had a cord <laughs> out of a tree that he attached it to the bottom root. There was a loop there and he, doing, <laughs> hey, doing, doing, check this out. And bass was born, you know. <laughs> Well, it's like Albert King on, on 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 at his house, right? He got he got a wire attached it to two nails, and that was Italy ball, man. Yeah, <laughs> this is gross. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you want to hear a funny cool. one? When when we were hooked up with Saul Bright, Phil and I did a, a some really nice private gigs. In fact, I remember we played for the um, uh, 
Um, she was the widow of the guy who invented Time Magazine. What's, what was her name? Clara Booth Luth. Cla Clara, Clara Booth Luce. Henry Luce's wife. She had this palatial place down in, uh, 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 by Diamond Head there, you know? So the three of us, all bright trio, me and my brother and Saul, we go there and they were like, we met the Arthur Murrays, <laughs> people like that, <laughs> by the pool was crazy. But you know, Saul, I don't know if you remember Bobby, Saul Bright had a big white 50s Cadillac convertible. It was a beautiful car. And we're on the way to this gig and he just stuck the big bass in the back seat <laughs> with the neck sticking up, you know, and fills up shotgun and I'm back with the bass, right? And we're driving along with the wind that we're going toward Diamond Head and the trades are blowing and the bass starts going, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> People are looking at us going by, whoa, whoa. All the strings were sympathetic. That was funny. Yeah, I, I got to sit in <laughs> with him um, one time at, um, I think it was UH. They had this Hawaii music contest. Um, yeah. Him in yeah, and he was a special guest, so he came on the last, the last song. All the bands got on stage, so somebody told me, "Play his steel. He's gonna do Hawaiian cowboy." So yeah. he does the beginning really slow. Just before he got <laughs> into the fast part, I did the horse, and he turns to me with a big smile on his face. Oh yeah, <laughs> perfect. But it, you know, just just to be on stage with, you know. The guys who started it all, you know. Yeah. It was, it was really chicken skin, man. <laughs> totally. Hey, you remember that place over? It was a, what would they call it? The Arboretum or something? It was where the aquarium was. You know the, the Olympic pool, that saltwater pool. It's Nanatorium. Nanatorium, oh, yeah. Nanatorium. We did a gig there. We did a gig there. They had gigs there inside. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Saul, so he had a string bass and he had he had a little tiny amp that he, he amplified it through, you know? And I had my amp and my steel guitar. I'm sitting next to him, we're playing. And that guy, what a kolohe. This is how those guys work. We're right in the middle of a song, we're doing like Kaneohe Hula or something. And it's, take it away, Ken. So I'm in the middle of this, just start the solo. And when I start playing, he starts talking to me. And he goes, hey, Ken. I'm like, fuck. I'm trying to, I'm trying to play like a, so I get some licks in, I go, what? <laughs> he goes, he's play, he doesn't hit, he's not skipping a beat on his bass or anything. He goes, you married? <laughs> I'm like, what's he asking me in the middle of a solo? I, mean, I go, no. And then I look up at him, he's got this big Hawaiian grin and he goes, enjoy life. <laughs> yeah, all these old, all these old timers was really kolohe. I mean, they had oh, fun. Man. Yeah, they had fun on stage. Daddy and, August yeah. guy. Oh. And not, nowadays, a lot of these young Hawaiian groups, they're too damn serious on stage. Serious, they gotta, man. They're going to loosen up, man. <laughs> and you know what? Hawaiians are inventive, man. Let me tell you. We were down there playing the Merry Monarch in 1980 with Mo. And, uh, you know, everyone's partying after. We're in the hotel room in Hilo. And, you know, um, Boogie Kalama? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boogie, Boogie Kalama, right? He's a musician. That guy's great. We're all jamming in there, and he doesn't have an instrument. And I can tell he was really Jones in the play. So what he did was he got a big, empty uh, gallon wine jug. Yeah. And he went and got a small, not a, a, a washcloth, but the, the, the bigger one, you know. And he, he got it wet and wringed it out, and he lined the bottom of this jug with it, and he went on the wall. And he was playing bass with it on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you just don't see that every day uh, too much. But you know what? Hawaiians really are good at the wash tub bass, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Some of these Hawaiians are virtuosos on the wash tub. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing what they can do with one string. You know? Yeah. And, you know, you might have heard some of these guys playing, like Hui Ohana and you know, uh, back in the 70s, some of these songs, you know, you listen to the bass player do this. Do, 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 do. They're like, yeah. and they're jamming. I mean, they're yeah. like, they're not, they're not laying back. They're, they'll be doing, even yeah. singing a, a verse or something. And man, the bass player is back there just freaking, you know, 
the high Double note. Four time <laughs> all the way through it. Da, 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 da. Mm. Yeah. And I, I remember um, in, in Papa Kulea, there's a Lunin's family. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, I was I was playing with this old couple, Jane and Willie Nunes. So they, we got hired to play a luau. And the guy told Willie, um, everybody want, wants upright bass, ukulele, and steel. So he comes with this old, um, I guess he was Contessa, you know, those Japanese brands of this um, Paul McCartney copy bass. Uh, so they said, what's the upright? So he said, wait, he got this old sponge and he stuck it in a back bridge and he goes, <laughs> so they said, that's my upright. <laughs> <laughs> it exactly. sounded like an upright, man. Yeah, yeah, just mute them up, man. Yeah, they do with what they had, man. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, it's unfortunate that steel, oh, man, you know, when I, I went to high school in on a walk, went to college for a while in Santa Cruz, and when I went back, there were, like, maybe one or two steel players in the musicians' union. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I, first of all, you know, I saw an opportunity, of course. <laughs> Yeah, and I did join them, and I remember. Um, and uh, but boy, it was man. They were. I'm like, this is a kind of a dying art in Hawaii. How can that be? You know, it's where it's from. Yeah. Well, so my parents, my parents, yeah. my okay. parents okay. lived in Hawaii Kai. Then you know, this is around 70, 75, I guess. And uh, my brother Phil had a. You know, he's always wheeling and dealing, man. And he had this Rickenbacker. It was a pretty nice one. Black uh, chrome Rickenbacker. So he put an ad in the paper to sell it. And we get a call from this guy. He goes, uh, is it okay if I come over and look at it? You know, and we're like, sure. So the guy shows up. And who is it? Jerry, Jerry. Bird. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell by that voice already. <laughs> yeah. Can I come and look at it? You know? As a Jerry Bird, so he was he tripped out, you know. He goes, "Any of you guys play this thing?" I go, "I do," you know. So that's that's the first time I ever met Jerry was through a, a, a advertisement. Man, that was cool. Yeah, we sat around, made coffee, and he talked. Man, went, oh god, the stories he had. That was great. That was great. Yeah, but uh, Barney was around, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh man, you know. When uh, when the dad had his 80th birthday party, um, all the Isaacs, all the Isaacs had a big party at this Chinese restaurant in Honolulu, and man, everybody who was still alive was there. It was a, that was an amazing time, and you know Alvin Isaac Senior. You know a lot of people don't know, but he played. He played with Johnny Noble out there on the Moana Hotel with a tricone. Yeah. So, you just keep finding bits of history here and there. Hey, Ken, I've I got a question for you. Going yeah. back to the, the, the topic of, um, you're talking about time time and just rhythm and, yeah, it, uh, it, you know, when I listen to Saul K. Bright, that's one of the first things that that hits you is just his time is perfect. Absolutely. You, know, mean, you can tell like, the difference. You can tell the difference between him and Solo OPE. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. Did he ever have when you played with them, did he ever have did he have any advice for you about uh about time feel or did he ever talk about it or was it just something that was just so natural? No, no, we never talked about it. God, we could have. I mean, I should have. I probably did, you know, because I told him I go, you know, solo OPE garnered a lot of uh, cred, you know, but I go, you, your touch on the tricone back in those days, you know, they had just invented electrical recording. So first of all, recording sounded better, you know, when he was recording his tricone, I think. But you know, <laughs> God, you know, it's not just his plane. It's like, how about the arrangements? You know, you ever heard that version of Heat Wave? Mm -hmm. that those guys do? It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure of his tuning on that. It's beautiful. 
beautiful work. And you know, it was like, get them in one take, guys. <laughs> no mixing. But the vocals on that thing are just perfect. I don't know how they did it. They must have done some test recordings. I don't know. That's a beautiful cut, that song. Was it so only long ago? Ken, do you know, was it only one microphone or was it like when it was electric? One, one, yes. One mic, man. <laughs> just kind of gather around, children. <laughs> Bass player, can you can you two steps back? <laughs> We once did a recording with our band, only one microphone, and the bass player was like in the other room almost. <laughs> you had you yeah. had to put him so far away because he was so loud. Right, he was playing really softly, but still. Yeah, yeah that's funny, man. Mess around this tune anymore. mess around with that that's what is that drop d it's pretty nice tuning didn't it uh, yeah well uh, yeah you know uh, when i got my first tricone those things were so expensive man It's like I had to pay $500 for a tricone back in 73 or something. That was a lot of money back then, you know? And so when I bought my tri, I thought, wow, this thing's going to be worth a lot of money, you know, like 30 years from now. Not really, <laughs> you know? You could pick up a Stratocaster, just, just two pieces of wood. Uh, you know, they're, they're not a craft. Thing like this right so I thought strats will never be worth anything oh, God. how do you figure that what's 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 a 54 strat now about 40 grand yeah isn't that amazing and it's just two pieces of wood with a microphone on a little pickup you know amazing I was wrong <laughs> I should have collected more strats <laughs> Yeah. Ken, I was going to ask you about your first album. Um, yeah. I think, I think it's your first album, and you have a lot of information about like how the like the frequency range is on on the back and all that stuff, which I guess. Oh yeah, that was sort of a takeoff. You know, when we did that album cover, we thought we were doing this big retro thing, right? So we got a bunch of sleeves from '78s and that thing on electrical recording. I go, hey, that's that's. That's when the sound really improved. They go, let's use that. So we put that in there. Yeah. That's very cool. That was, a, that was fun. That was a fun. The guy who took that picture for that album was a really well-respected photographer. I can't think of his name now. David Redfern, something. He had pictures of Hendrix he took that were amazing. Now, Bobby and I, you know, Bobby and I didn't know each other back then. It's probably a good thing, bro, because we would have both been Kalohi together. <laughs> But, you know, I moved from San Francisco and I was old enough back then. See, my dad was flying overseas six months out of the year. So, you know, I was hitching and going with my friends to Winterland and Avalon and all that. And then we, and then when we moved to Hawaii, I'm like, I was kind of bummed because I was seeing all these great bands, you know, this is a, just before the summer of 68. So when I get to Hawaii, hey, they were doing the Civic Auditorium. They were doing oh, yeah. the Waikiki Shell. And I saw Jimi Hendrix there, what, three times in Hawaii? <laughs> oh, it's great, man. They were all there, you know? Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was great. 
So Mike it wasn't that. And, then, yeah. and then Quicksilver moved over there, remember? They were living in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. best thing I like about that band was that guy's SG, man. <laughs> Cipollina, man, with the vibrato. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they all came to Hawaii. In fact, at the Led Zeppelin, the last time they came down at the Civic, you know, Phil, Phil told me, yeah, I was in the front there too, but we, we didn't know each other. Oh, cool. No, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the first Zeppelin tour, 69. And then the next time they played, they were at the arena, you know. But the Civic was cool. It reminded me of, you know, some of those smaller places, you know. Yeah, not, no fancy yeah. show. They just, I remember the, they played the Civic when Jimmy Page had his full beard. Yeah. yeah so... <laughs> So the lights are off and, and you could you could see it any place. So we was right at the foot of the stage and yeah. you know, no announcement. You see Robert, it's kind of dark, Robert, Robert Plant, John, and you know, the rest of the musicians setting up this stuff and everybody was wondering, where's Jimmy Page? And he comes on with a quarter of Heineken <laughs> and, and his eyes look so bloodshot like Bob Marley's, almost brown. Been on, been on the road. He's dragging his <laughs> left pole on the, on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I get out there. I get out there, like, in the middle of 68, you know, early, just before summer. I go to Campbell High School. There were no ukuleles. There were no Hawaiian music. They were oh, yeah, listening exactly. to, they were listening to uh, they, the, all, the, all the locals that really liked um, soul music, and they also liked, they loved the Rascals right yeah oh yeah and they were just starting to get you know the, the san francisco sound was a little foreign to them because they had this more of a and james brown had played you know play the civic i think and all that so uh mm -hmm. they had to adjust to the the hippie thing you know but there was no the point is there was there was really our young young guys and all musicians i didn't hear anybody playing hawaiian music but oh, yeah. it didn't take long it didn't take long that was like 68 69 by 70 Right around 70, before I left, 71, the, uh, man, it was just starting to, it was, man, what a great flourish of rediscovery of Hawaiian music. And that's when the young guy, Casimero's and Peter Moon and Sonny Manoa and all you know, that. You know why? Because it was because of Gabby and the Sons of Hawaii, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Gabby's really the one who kind of kept it going, those guys. They were doing those slack key albums, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, you hear Feet Rogers for the first time and you go, wow, that guy, he's got a special sound to him, man. And, you know, Feet, he would play four sheets to the wind, man. That guy was, he was, he was a character. He liked to get loaded. Yeah. He would take the shit, he would, he would disappear, oh, yeah. man. Have, like all these gigs and it's like, where's Feet? He got on a ship. He's heading out to Shanghai. He's gonna go bang the gong, you know. Yeah, he, he was a merchant seaman. That's yeah. it. He I went remember over to China to go chink a little, you know, bang the gong. Man. I remember sitting with him. It's from pure head. China white, you know. Yeah, <laughs> what a character, yeah. man. But God, remember, what a soul. I remember sitting with him in his in his uh, apartment, right across Mayright's housing. And he's sitting right in front of me with his shades. So I finally had the guts to ask him, why do you get hot? You know, you, you drink up and, you know, you, you got substance abuse. What's with that? So he takes off his glass, his shades. He looked at me, he said, you smoke a pakalolo? I said, yeah. He go, well, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> He said, we all got vices, main thing, you don't make trouble. You know? <laughs> oh, that's great. That's classic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you were here when I when earlier on I was talking about being at the Blue Dolphin room. Oh. Feet's feet, feet, uh, steel was underneath the stage, the little curtain there. And of all the days I go to, to, to pull it out and check the tuning, he shows up and taps me on my shoulder. <laughs> I never got the tuning. Classic. I got him now, though. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. but one of, one of the best stories he told me, he, he was playing at the Dolphin Room. 
I guess it was way before that, but he said the waitress brought, brought up a napkin with him and on the napkin said, oh, aloha, my name is Jerry Bird. I'm a professional steel guitar. Can I come up <laughs> and play your steel? Play a couple songs to the band? So Feet looks at me, he said, you know what I did? I said, shoot. And then um, as he was walking up the stage, Jerry was walking on. He said, Jerry saw that fat 60 gauge string, you know? <laughs> Yeah. The, the the bass on his on his bake light and Jerry yeah. was like kind of puzzled and feet told me he walked up the stage he couldn't stop laughing and he said <laughs> to everyone in there not knowing that it's the family tuning the yeah and he's yeah. He said, so he starts hello much and Jerry go um a feet told me he sounded anything but professional. He <laughs> <laughs> got intimidated. Yeah, I, I told Pete, you would do that. He said, well, the guy wanted to come on stage. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, you know, like I get students. I used to have students. And I'm always telling them, you know, don't be afraid to play chimes, man. You're yeah, going to miss them. You're going to miss them. But you know what? The more you play them, the more you'll get them. That's all I can yeah. tell you. Yeah, you know, so don't be afraid to go for it, you know, and yeah, you get, yeah. you get really good at covering up your mistakes when you miss a chime, right? <laughs> kind of incorporate it somehow. Yeah, I meant to, I meant that space, you know. But <laughs> feet, man, feet Rogers was just a master of the chimes. God, his touch and his chimes, you know, Bird was too, you know, yeah. Bird was real slick, you know. Feet was more root scene. He played the Rickenbacker, not a you know pedal. And and that guy, um, he had so much feel. I remember talking to David Kelly one time, and Feet always told me that David was his idol. You know, David mm -hmm. Kelly. So yeah. I asked I asked David Kelly one time. I, I saw his number in a phone book, so I called him up. <laughs> David Kelly. Yeah. Yeah, so, not a Kelly, right? Yeah. So I asked yeah, David. yeah, Phil and I found him. That, you know, he lived a long time, and that was good because David was a real yeah. source. And yeah, we do that too. We go out and see him on the west side. But the funny thing is, I asked, I asked David Kelly. I said, "Who's your favorite steel player?" So he told me, "Oh, the boy." I said, "The boy." He said, "Yeah, feet, feet Rogers." And <laughs> you know, I was blown away. And then, like David told me, he said. That guy, when he when he played simple and slow, um, you know it was coming straight from his heart, hundred percent feel, you know. That's that's a real compliment. Yeah, and yeah, from his idol and. So, so did and, you tell Feet? <laughs> oh no, this was this was <laughs> Feet. Uh, uh, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I I told my friends, don't get me wrong. Now, if Feet wants to floorboard that gas pedal he can fly on that steel <laughs> yeah he can yeah 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 man i mean he made the art out of just a turnaround <laughs> yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> his lips are like wow that's yeah. cool <laughs> yeah, it's exactly man. and he did a lot of that muting too you know yeah yeah oh yeah Sometime on the whole song, he would mute. Huh? Yeah, yeah, right. No, but yeah. the, the reason why he's my favorite is um, when I used to go over and talk with him, you know, he would talk straight from his heart. And he wasn't well to do. He told me, I live from, you know, I live day, day to day, you know. But he told me, you know, once you're happy in your heart, you don't need nothing else. And then from there you share it, you know. That was so cool. Aloha e kua. Yeah. I loko pu eh? Aye. He's right. Yeah. What's the uh, muting playing that you're talking about? How do you do the muting? Oh. Yeah, I, I can I can do it on this one. <clears throat> this, this has got the tuning. <laughs> you palm me in the back of the pickup. <laughs> Right? Yeah, that's one of the coolest sounds, man. 
Yeah, all muted. It's right, he would do a whole song sometimes like that. What yeah. a great effect. So you're putting your palm on the bridge, the entire bridge, basically? Yeah, yeah, you're right down at the bridge and you're just hanging that big part of your palm over the string, yeah. get a nice yeah, that's great. chopped off note, you know? You can't do it on a national. Got that T-bar in the way. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, with the national, you you know, you get, you you want to do new stuff and try things out, you know. So I I do stuff like a minor tuning, or I or I play. I go. I'm always about flipping it, you know. Something like uh, play a whole song in slack steel and D, even though it's a G tuning. Or I do like a minor tuning and play in major, you know, like yeah. a, here's your major. Then you get a, go to a major four or five and wow, it's like a great effect, but you're still playing the song is in G major. Before Saul, there was all that stuff from 1915 now, that craze, and they did all these waltzes, and this, the playing was simpler then, but it's very, to me, a real uh, Hawaiian, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was going to ask about that. Um... You know, Frank Ferreira, you know. And Frank Ferreira did triplets, though. I mean, he did... Another thing a challenge is to play the slack steel in a waltz tempo. So you're now you're going ba, da 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 with your thumb, but you're playing the melody on top of it. So you know. tuning then the other thing is that so, so you, if, if you want to flip that you go to a major G and then you play in a minor you find the minor and your minor or your four minor you'll have to slide that part do a slant playing on a major key <laughs> but it really really switches the mood around doing that minor stuff Drink vodka. 
and, and you know something, Ken, like the, the old Hawaiians, they had a real uh, common sense way of, you know, telling me, they said, you know, music got no rules. You just do, you can do whatever you want to do. They said, the main rule is your instrument has to be in tune. <laughs> so, <laughs> after that, there's no rules, you know. Yeah. yeah and I mean, smart. also, you know, we were smart enough not to ask them. Oh, yeah. We would just, we would do what they would tell us without us asking them. They would say, <laughs> shut up, <laughs> listen, look. That's yeah. it. <laughs> Funny, I remember. How do you do this or that? Go, you know, you know what? Yeah. Just watch and listen. Watch. Because they said that the, the three rules of that, they said, when you want to learn from the old timers, you open your eyes, open your ears, and shut your mouth. <laughs> exactly. And then what would they do? You know what they would do? They'd put a paper bag over their hand. And <laughs> <laughs> but you know uh, what? You, you have to develop your ears. That's the only way, man. That's it. Yeah. 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 Well, it's hard if you don't have an ear, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 feet had another saying to that. He said, you know, if you cannot find, if you want to play steel and you cannot find a note on there, he said that you could, then you go buy a boat and a fishing pole. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Raymond Connie, right? The yeah. Guy, <laughs> so, hey, can you teach me that? Sure. Can you catch fish? <laughs> Are you a good diver? <laughs> yeah, he made him pay for it, didn't he? He was out oh, there. Yeah. Getting hoo -hoo. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, when you find out how the, how the old timers learn, I mean, we thought we had it hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, these guys, yeah, I, I, I used to go over to Raymond Connie's house, and he was saying, okay, before you planning on coming in the house, coming to the house. He called me the night before, you have to. So I said, oh, okay. So the first time we called, not knowing why we should call the night before, <laughs> we go to his house and there's a table full of Hawaiian food. <laughs> That's so it. We eat first and then we play. <laughs> That's it, man. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. You know, I I, uh, I moved back to the mainland. By the way, Bobby, I was sorry to hear about your mom. No, but you know what? God we, bless, we, man. We, we, we parted last night, and we all looked at each other. We said, you know what? We should be thankful that mom didn't suffer. You know, like some guys would have a stroke, some people, and they would suffer for months, yeah? Yeah. But, yeah, so... Last night, man, we we parted. I mean, she's just like <laughs> just like everybody on the in the neighborhood. I live in Aia Heights. Said they was looking out the uh, window. Yeah. <laughs> it was a crazy family again. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I'm I'm glad she didn't suffer. Yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. with your dad. She's with your Ohana. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like and that's you said, why you know. I moved back to the mainland partially because I <clears throat> I own some property in Oregon that I'm working on yeah. over all these years, and uh, and you know I was commuting, I was commuting from Kauai coming over and when I would play with the Rowans and different guys and you know and I tour I was gone a lot I tour Europe a lot come through here the Bay Area, you know and I got roots here, and when the when the economy really flopped in 2008, oh, yeah. remember that? Yeah. I thought, you know what? My folks are really getting old now and I want to spend time with them. So I came back to the mainland, you know, and because of George Kahumoku and all those gigs they over there, I'm over there, you know, if it wasn't for COVID, I'd have been there four times this year already, you know, so I, it's close enough being in California. Um, I do desire to get a little Big Island plot and spend more time, you know, I will. Well, I remember the first time we met. You remember that bar? 
Well, I mentioned before that, but yeah, the bar, that was a strange thing, man. You know, you don't hear a steel bar stories very often, do you? <laughs> In fact, you don't hear it. I had this, somebody gave me this killer steel bar and it had a hologram on the butt end of it, like a rainbow thing, you know? And the bullet yeah. end on it, it came yeah. and it had a little bit of a point, you know? That was the most killer steel bar. And I had that thing and I, had, I, I, I was on Maui and I was rushed to get to the airport and I had had it in my pocket, didn't want it to fall out. So I put it in the ashtray of the rental car and I left it in there. That's, that's how I finally lost. I did finally lose that thing. It was just meant to go away from me. But before that, it involves Bobby, oddly enough. I had that killer bar and uh, I had it in a, a fanny pack, you know, like a bum bag, that leather one that had my wallet and all my stuff in it. So I'm at Hanalei Pier and, you know, I'm looking all around and waiting and I was going to do a quick jump in, you know, but, you know, you got to watch out for Kaiva. Yeah. The thief, you know, so, so, I, so I, I, I sat there for 15 minutes, man, looked around, there's nobody, you know, this is good. So I, I had a van back then. I, I take the, I take the, the bag and I, I lean forward and I stuff it up underneath the dash, right? Way back in there, like no one's ever going to find us if they do break in. So I stuck it under the dash, locked the van. I went out to the end of the pier and I even waited out there for a while. Nothing, yeah, okay. So I dive in the water. I swim around for about five minutes. Come in, somebody had broken in. They watched me the whole time. And they got this bag, right, with my credit cards and and and, and the steel bar was in there, right? <laughs> okay, so it's, it's lost, okay? And this is where Bobby can pick up on this one. <laughs> And it yeah, was like, cool. maybe what, how about a, maybe a year later? Yeah. About a year later, you tell them. Okay. A year later, I started playing with uh, Bill Kaiva. So he would, he would bring us to his, uh, his property. Um, uh, what was, what's that name of the place now? Um, this private property on where they own. Uh, Kiba Kai out there. Ah, what's the name of that place? But well, anyway, so we're playing at this big luau. And then um, this little girl, little Hawaiian girl mix, she comes up to me, she said, Uncle, I found this on the sand. And I looked at it, I said, Oh, wow, it's a nice bar, man. So <laughs> she said, oh, Uncle, I give them to you because um, I'm too small to play. Um, steel guitar. <laughs> so I said, oh, thanks. And then a couple of years later, we got invited, uh, us with Bill Kaiba, to the Tarot Festival in Hanalei. Right. So, and I played there. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I tried using the bar and it, it just um, didn't fit because I used the tapered one, like feet, feet Rogers. There. So I see Ken. And that's the first time I met Ken. He comes up to me. He goes, Bobby, Bobby, you know, when he, when he is, you know, with that fancy handshake and he telling his friends, you don't know who Bobby is. This is the king of electric. <laughs> so I said, oh, thank you. And, and I take out the bar, I told Ken, hey, you know, you, you can have this. This little girl found it on the beach on the sand. He looked at it and he said, that's my bar. <laughs> That's I mean, my bar. Where yeah. the hell did you find it? And he says this little girl found it in the sand <laughs> in Hanalei, and it was there all that time. That's and just you, crazy, man. And then you and met I her. Look at that going. This is my bar. And he's going. I know. I just gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember you meeting the. I think it was the granddad or, or the grandmother, and you were so happy. You told him. If your granddaughter ever needs lessons how to play steel, call me. 
<laughs> you were the happiest yeah. guy in that whole festival, man. I can't yeah. believe it, man. <laughs> and I ended up leaving that in an ashtray of a rent car on Maui. <laughs> After hey, all that. Going, maybe it's going back to the girl. You never know, man. <laughs> hey, maybe, yeah, maybe it'll show up again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess that was just before we went to Japan. That was fun. Well, hanging in Japan with you was was really man. So how's this, you guys? We go do this great concert in Nagoya, Japan, <clears throat> and uh, and we're there for a while. We went up to the onsens and all that stuff, and then these guys are leaving. And I asked the Nobuchi, uh, the guy who hosted us. I go, yes. I go. Uh, is it okay if I stay another day? We're in this nice hotel, the Tokyo Hotel. Sure, you can stay. So uh, I'm like, cool. So I say, who we ho to all these guys? And they, they all leave, right? And you're lucky you got back that day. So they all leave. And the next day I'm there, and I'm going to leave the next morning. So that evening I'm sitting in a private karaoke club with a guy named Mori, drinking some beers and, and goofing off on the on the uh, singing Elvis stuff on that, what do you call it? The, what do you call that Japanese thing? Karaoke, karaoke, right? Yeah. And his cell phone rings and you know, the Japanese are super polite. So he talks a bit and he hangs up, you know, and, and then it rings again, it kept ringing, you know? So so uh, he wanted to make sure, so the, the bartender was real bored and he had a little TV underneath the, the front of the bar there where you could wipe glasses and, and watch this TV. Maury gets up and walks over there and he goes, put it on CNN. They put it on yeah. CNN and then he flags me over, right? And yeah. I walk, I go, what's going on, man? And he goes, look at this. And I go look and I see the, you can see the, um, the tower in New York, you know, with yeah. smoke coming out of one side. And this is real time, right? Yeah. And I go, wow, what's going on? And the second plane hit. It was 9 11, 2001. Yeah. And I, I watched it in real time and I went, holy cow, man, I got this chicken skin. So, long story short, they closed the airspace and I was stuck in Japan with, you know, I didn't know when I was going to get out. Yeah, but yeah. you know what I heard from Kobuchi? He said, you drank all of them under the table. <laughs> <laughs> That guy you know couldn't that, throw. Hey, you know what? That brother couldn't throw me because I had too many ex-Japanese girlfriends. You know, <laughs> I was like, he. I had fugu twice. You know, the poisonous puffer fish. I thought, should I eat this the third time? <laughs> I don't know. But man, I had some crazy food with that guy. It was awesome. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I, he was impressed. I go, I ate everything that was in front of me. This one had yeah, this like yeah, orange yeah, noodle. Yeah. You know, crunchy. I go. I go, sensei, uh, or she, uh, I go, what is this? And he goes, oh, that's very good. That's Jerry fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now the Japanese are great over there. They love Hawaiian music. Oh, I mean, full on. Yeah. And the Japanese girls can drink way more than a Japanese guy. <laughs> I've seen girls who drank Hawaiians under the table. <laughs> <laughs> and they can still walk a straight line. Oh, man. Yeah. Now, that's cool, you know. Everywhere you go, the, the, the traces of Hawaiian music are everywhere. Yeah. You know? All over the how, how did you pick it up on it, Sebastian? I mean, what made you want to play yeah. Hawaiian music? That's a funny story, actually. My wife's parents, they lived in Hawaii for over 10 oh. years. And so we went there all the time for holidays and stuff. And mm -hmm. I went actually to um, to a bar where Ledward Kapana was playing, like Slack Key. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, that was the first uh, touch point. I think I, I bought this one DVD, like learning Slack Key guitar. 
And then I listened, to, uh, I really enjoyed it. And then I listened to a, um, a, a CD, like a reissue of like all soul P stuff and King Benny. And I thought, okay, this is even cooler. I have to learn that. And so, yeah. That's it. <laughs> It, it's infectious. It totally you, is. You right. get the infection, yeah. it's it, the rest of your life. You'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, Pascal, I played in Paris a lot, and I learned about, you know, uh, the players there were back in the old days that recorded. Yeah. Bourdon, was that the name of one of those guys? Muted. Write it. <laughs> Gino Bourdain. Gino Bourdain. Gino, yeah. Yeah, that guy uh, played back in the way back in the old days and did a lot of recording in, in France. Yeah. And of course, the English guys, a lot of those guys were playing back in the pretty far back, you know? Yeah, and Tao Moi was also living in Berlin for a while. Yeah, yeah. Tao Moi. Yeah. yeah. He, played for, he, he played for the Fuhrer. <laughs> not, not too many guys can say that <laughs> yeah there's some crazy stories right that he was that like, was crazy. The, yeah there was a benefit uh party for whatever and he was playing there and the nazis were there it's like it's a weird story <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable yeah yeah man ken, ken you know you remember henry de willigan yeah yeah, well, during the war time, you know, they was in Germany and they was playing at this club. And he is a steel player, yeah? And he said a lot of German soldiers would be drawn to the music. So they wanted to come into the club. But the club only <laughs> said, you got to leave your rifles outside. <laughs> so, you know, they started attracting all these German soldiers. And then when, uh, when the Fuhrer heard about this, he shot that club down because yeah. Uh, he had a, yeah, you know, music was bringing peace. Yeah, yeah you, you don't want to influence the guys too much here. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah they'll, they'll get lazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, here's a good, here's a good quick story. Hopefully quick. When I was playing in Waikiki with Mo Keale, yeah, it was uh, it was near Christmas time. This is around 1980, 81, 80, I guess. And there was this guy that had gray hair like me, <laughs> older guy, and he stayed the whole night. You know, at the end, he walked up and introduced himself. His name was Roland Spencer Ford, and he said, "You know, I played steel guitar in England back in the 30s, and I had a band." And, uh, and then, the, the, you know, the Netherlands have a lot of these Indonesian and Islanders that, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Rudy Wairata, I don't wanna, yeah. uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, so they were playing in the Netherlands and, and it was popular for Hawaiian music in the thirties. They had a yeah. circuit going, right? So yeah. the, so, uh, he's playing over there and then, uh, and then, uh, how did it happen? Yeah, then the war broke out, right? So he was back in that area, you know, on the continent in the British army and got captured by the Germans. And he was in a camp and he had a he had a Hawaiian trio in the in the prison camp. <laughs> yeah. Was and it was in the Netherlands, right? So so uh he says they used to they took away their regulation boots and gave them uh wooden shoes and they hated them right so when they march into the mess hall he said they made so much noise that they gave him their shoes back <laughs> <laughs> oh man but he actually had a hawaiian trio in a in a in a camp during the war so after the war he went, kept playing and did his regular thing and then all these decades had gone by and his wife had passed on and i met there i am meeting him in hawaii for the first time and it turned out he was a really well-known uh, landscape artist. He did watercolors and stuff. And so um, I invited him to my house for Christmas because, you know, he was just hanging out in Waikiki and he just lost his wife, you know. Yeah. 
and I lived in Lanikai on the beach there. So it was really nice. He came out and he gave me some uh, painting tips and stuff, you know, and I, we talked to all this music and played the old records and it was really cool. And he went back to England and sent me this beautiful uh, painting rolled up, he sent me this painting. Yeah. yeah, man, you know, Hawaiian music. It's, it's almost everywhere. You can get to anybody, anybody. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, on one of those steel sites, somebody posted one of those Bakelite uh, slide bars, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I go, hey, I got one of those, man. So <laughs> I dug this thing out, checked it. Where's the camera? There. Yeah, build. Looks pretty good. It's a funny material, yeah. Practice those harmonics, <laughs> right, Bobby? Oh yeah. yeah. And you know, it's harder. It's harder on acoustic to play harmonics. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wait. Get the fourth and the fifth. Yeah, up close. <laughs> I'll tell you who was the genius of that was. Um, Billy Hugh Land. Oh. oh, that's man. oh, that's another guy that we got yeah. to know. Oh, yeah. Billy yeah. Hugh Land, man. Do you know about him, Sebastian? Definitely. Billy yeah. Hugh Land. Yeah, yeah. Sure. He, he his hand was mangled in an accident, mm -hmm. so as yeah. he wore this leather glove with a bar sewn into the. And when he played, whenever he did a, a forward slant, his elbow would go out. Yeah. Remember. Because his hand, he had to keep the you know glove on. So he, when he's seeing him from a distance, he'd be going like this a lot. He go, oh, that's a forward slant. Yeah, but man, the guy could play harmonics so unbelievable. Yeah. He would he would play you know he would, he would play off the the one, the five, and then the those real high ones where you're playing. You know your hands are together like this yeah. playing yeah. Yeah. And I mean he could actually just. Oh, unbelievable! And you met you met his brother, Buddy, Buddy Hill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the funny thing is, Buddy, Buddy told me, um, you know, Billy was a steel player before the accident, but after yeah. the accident, you know, that paper printing press or something. He said after the accident, he became a way better steel player. Yeah, yeah, you know, determination, yeah. yeah. Unreal. Yeah, you guys should go on YouTube sometime and look up Billy Helen. I think he's playing with Genoa. Yeah. Uh, he's doing Maui Chimes or something. He's like, yeah. God, it's crazy <laughs> what he's doing, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Crazy yeah. energy, right? Like it's full on. Oh, yeah. In yeah. these, these chimes that he does, you know? Yeah. He's, Billy kind of, he's, Helen. he's the Chango Reinhardt of Hawaiian music, I would say, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to say who's the, oh, here's a Django story. <clears throat> I'm in Paris, and uh, my friend, uh, Jaja, her uncle, her great uncle played drums with Django, right? And she goes, you should come over to the house because we're getting this. Mike Lewis just restored the ukulele, the Django ukulele. And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, Django gave it to my great uncle. And it's this flat backed ukulele made in France. So I'm like, I have to see this thing, right? So I go, I go to the house and sure enough, there it is. And it was, it had a real thin body. It wasn't deep, you know? It was kind of like concert size, but it had a, 
and it sounded beautiful. I don't know who made it. So um, I had a fez, you know, that, <laughs> I got a picture of me with a tie-dye shirt and a fez on holding the Django U. <clears throat> I got that in the archive somewhere. That's kind of interesting thinking that Django had a ute. Yeah, what did he do on that? Uh. It's like those old, uh, I think Gary Eichel had a Gretsch bass, upright bass with a flat back. Yeah. Yeah, and it's strange to see anything with a flat back, you know, like ukulele and bass, but it sounded good, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, we found some old instruments back in the day, though. It's hard now. You know, we found a, a Colwood um, guitar coat made out of coal. That was a, it was a really early um, Kamaka. And I mean, from like early, early, probably 1920 or. Yeah, yeah. I think it was a Kamaka. It had a pineapple on the headstock, but it was an old, old guitar. Yeah, that's the one Auntie Alice is playing and I got one of my pictures. Yeah, you know what, Auntie Alice, man, you know, the Hawaiians, <laughs> I tell you, they don't, they don't mess around when they mean something, okay? <laughs> and, back, back, and you know what, this was a lesson for me for, okay, you think you're a hot shot and you learned all those licks and all, but you know what? Where's the soul, you know, sometimes, right? And, I, and, and when I was, I learned a lot from her. She would play, you know, this, this, these old pieces, you know. And I go, well, well what do you think of, you know, Peter Moon? <laughs> she goes, that's rock. She goes, you know what she said? That's rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a real important lesson to keep it, keep yeah. it sweet too, man. You know? Yeah, yeah. and the LS, you know, funny thing, what you said, Feet told me the same thing. Yeah, you can play just like me, but you're too shallow. <laughs> and, and when I first met Ante Alice, I'm playing at her birthday party, so I noticed after we're playing, everybody just leave her by herself on a wheelchair, you know, and they go, they go <laughs> talk sorry. So I sit by her, she calls me over, she said, boy, come. So she said, you play by ear, yeah? And, you know, I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> young and stupid. So I said, oh, how can you tell? <laughs> so she goes, what do you mean how I can tell? I know you play all different places, but write notes. What's the matter with you? <laughs> That's it. But you That's know it. what? Without meeting these old timers, uh, you know, they give you lessons that last you a lifetime, man. That's right. It's yeah. not always about music, but it is. Yeah, yeah the yeah. heart. You gotta, because when Fee told me, you're too shallow, I look at him <laughs> and he said, he said, you know what? He said, when you give me this bake light, I know there's something good in you because right now you're a young punk. <laughs> <laughs> And you think you know everything, you know. No, there ain't no fooling them. There ain't no fooling yeah. them. You know, Gabby was another one, man. That guy was, you know, he was a good steel player, man. Oh, brother. He recorded more. He had a real nice touch and yeah. sweet, you know. He's a great steel player. But we talk all about, you know, it's funny, man. You know, I, finally I get to sit down and talk with Gabby. And what do we end up talking about? We end up talking about Django Reinhardt. <laughs> <laughs> you know th those guys were very well schooled in music you know and they yeah. they, they knew music very well man he, he loved Django yeah yeah there's not enough recordings of Gabby on steel you know uh, yeah yeah there, actually there's some pretty good steel playing of him on uh, other albums like those early yeah. Sunday Manoa records right yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And, <laughs> what a, and, man, and what a character that guy. And yeah, there's recordings he did with uh, Sterling Mossman too. You know, because Sterling Mossman would record with a lot of different steel players, yeah? 
Yeah. And if you can get the CD or the album of Sterling Mossman, Happy in Hawaii, Gabby playing a couple songs on there, and it's like, you know, I mean, it floors you. <laughs> I mean, that guy yeah. could do things that, um, on tunings that, you know, other people say it's impossible. Well, nothing is impossible for Gabby. <laughs> you know, did you ever hear any of those um, Aloha Po'a Lima shows we did at KKC, KCCN uh, with Harry Soria? It was before his territorial airways, Jackie, you know. Skylark, um, yeah. Leilani Skylark, yeah, and man, <laughs> I, I we have some tapes. I gotta find them. I have a lot of stuff in storage, but we would do these live shows on on Friday, and you know, <laughs> Gabby would show up already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and but Ralph Alapai, all those guys, and man, the stories they would come up with, and we would play live on the air. It was, it, that was that was a great time. Ralph Alapai was a steel player, yeah? He played bass. Oh. That was, was with the, that was with the Andy Cummings days. Uh, yeah. And, was, you know, was and Gabby team. would say, you know, Gabby would say Joe Custino is one of his favorites. You know, yeah. Joe Custino. And he's probably not recorded enough either. But yeah. Gabby raved about his steel playing. Yeah. A lot of people. Joe Cust There's a name that to file away, Joe Custino, you know, just yeah. try and find those recordings, yeah. The yeah, Andy one, has some great bands. The only one I know of Joe Custino is on one of Genoa's album, um, Hula's of Hawaii. And there's yeah. Benny Rogers on some songs and Joe Custino on some songs. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I got stuff archived. I gotta go through it. I got some of that live stuff on the white beach at Waikiki, you know, where the, the bands are just cooking, man. They're just swinging like yeah. hard. <laughs> there was that jazz bands, man. It's Hawaiian music, but they were swinging out, you know? God, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it has so much. Now Waikiki ain't got nothing. <laughs> yeah. I used to, uh, you know, when we had the showroom next to the Casamaros at the Ala Moana Americana, yeah. you know, and, and I would go, I lived in the hotel for almost a year. <laughs> and, you know, during the day, you know, I'm in my 20s, right? So I'm like surfing in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I would take my guitar and go down to the most expensive bar, which was at the beach in front of the Royal. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I would go sit at the very end with my back to everybody with no money, just shorts on, one t shirt, and a guitar, and start playing steel. And there's a Mai Tai. <laughs> it just come up. <laughs> and I'd, I'd play there, you know, I'd start getting half crocked, like I got to go to work, you know, I got to go get a nap in before work. Oh, that was fun. But, you know, it just shows you like the interest is there. Like, hey, he's playing Beach of Waikiki on the Beach of Waikiki yeah, <laughs> on a steel yeah. guitar, you know? Yeah. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. It's changed a lot, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even back in the 60s, it's hard to imagine no freeways on Oahu. Yeah. It wasn't crowded. <laughs> You go to Waikiki and there were all these old bungalows and what an atmosphere, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Ah, just, it was awesome. But yeah. you know, sometimes we play on the sidewalk. You know, I bring my little microcube and we see <laughs> the Duke Hanumoku statue and we start playing <laughs> and the crowd, I mean, steel guitar still gets to everybody, you know? Exactly. It's, Especially the kids, oh man. I love the yeah. 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 It's gonna come back to Waikiki, I know, man. <laughs> yeah, it will. Things take a long you know, time. You know, was, you know what was fun for me, Bobby, was in high school, you know, I'm a Howley, right? And in my school, I was a minority, man. It was, 
But, you know, whenever you get out on the beach, I lived in Never Beach, you know, I go out there and I'd, I'd flip it and start playing some steel. And that's a local out guy where I go, hey, bro, where are you learn to do that? <laughs> you play steel guitar. <laughs> I said, I'm playing a Johnny Winter lick. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Johnny Winter, man, there's a picture, you can find it on the internet of him and Edgar, and they're like these two little kids, and yeah. they each got ukuleles. <laughs> <laughs> so when I met Johnny, I'm like, hey, Johnny, I go, hey, you, you play ukulele? He goes, oh, how do you know that? I go, I saw, I saw a picture on the internet. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I go, hey, I learned the same way, man. You know, the ukuleles, when you got small hands, it's it's the best. It's the best guitar training advice. Yeah, there you go. In, in fact, everybody, every kid on Hawaii started on the ukulele. Yeah. yeah. Hey, fire that thing up there. Is that a metal one? Oh, there you go. Yeah, nice. Rabco, pl pl play a little. Come on. Yeah, give I'm us you. a little. Uh... <laughs> no, I was just. It was so, so boring that I just played my ukulele. No, <laughs> no, no I, I will not play. I will say something else. When you were talking before about uh, learning from the old timers, uh, it reminded me of um, uh, a great experience I had when I interviewed Letka Apana like 25 wow. years ago. 25 years ago. And I, I was already into Hawaiian music then. And um, I asked him, can I, as a white boy, play Hawaiian music? And he, <laughs> he punched me on the chest. And, I was, and, and he looked at me and he said, do you have a heart? I said, oh, I said yeah. yeah, I have a heart. And he said, then you can play Hawaiian music. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There you go. Right on. <laughs> That's great. You know, Ledward's pretty good steel player. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> nice, nice roll, nice roll technique. The double, the double strum. Yeah. Yeah. I like George? to, um, you know, I, um, when I was in touring one time over in Europe, I was with a Tahitian band. That was great. Terry Taputu's troupe, you know, dance troupe. And we, we played in Portugal, right? So I'm like, hey, Ukulele is a Portuguese, that's where it came from, right? Yeah. So, so Terry had his Tahitian uke, you know. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about right hand. And, and I had my koa ukulele. So he represented Tahiti, I re represented Hawaii. And we were in Portugal and we went and got together with these Portuguese guys, right? And it was fun, man. But I was surprised, like, you know what? They used like a slack tuning. Like the, the top string on a regular uke, it was down a full step. And yeah. they also used metal strings on like half, most of the ukes had metal strings on them. And that was surprising. <laughs> that was <fun. laughs> you got, I got that song in my head now. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, the ukulele is really good for um, New Orleans jazz, you know. Yeah. The banjo. <laughs> yeah, some Jelly Roll Morton. <laughs> yeah. Well, shoot, man. Anybody got anything they want to? Add or ask or you know, I was gonna ask her and 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 you too, Bobby. Um, you know, what what's your advice for the uh aspiring, you know, steel guitarists, you know, people that are just starting? Uh, 
Well, <laughs> I would tell them listen to the old stuff. You know, um, the old music, when you think about it, like I said, a lot of young ones now are too serious. You, you listen to the old stuff and you can, you can tell they was having a whole lot of fun. They brought the backyard onto the stage and we got to get that right. back. Yeah, yeah. And also tell yeah. them if you need help, if you need help, I'm retired from Thomas Sherman Market. I help you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what it's, it really is about? You can't teach people feel. Yeah. That's why, exactly. that's why Led gave you the old, yeah. you know, that's where it starts, man. Yeah, right yeah. in the heart. Yeah. Yeah, you play. You gotta play. You gotta play from, in you know within you, man. Your heart, you know. And you know, and you know what it's like. And and what helps with that is whatever you're comfortable with. You know, you don't have to start out with an eight string. You know. Yeah. I don't yeah. even play eight strings. I'm old school. I play six strings. That's it. You know. <laughs> I mess around once in a while, but. I don't play E9. I don't play C6. I don't do any of that stuff. That's why I don't get the calls to play all those concerts over in Hawaii. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from the 1920. You know? I don't fit into that. I don't fit into that bag, you know. I think all the extra strings is what chases a lot of the guitarists away from, bring, from getting into steel guitar, really. Because, you know, if you look at it from a guitar perspective, it's like just a detuned guitar. But then you add a couple of strings and people are like, whoa, whoa, I don't know what, what, what's going on. Man. <laughs> Ten strings. Well, you, on. Yeah. You know, it's like I, I could never play a pedal steel for one thing. I could never put that sucker in the trunk of my car to go do a gig. Are you kidding me? That's way too much work. Man. <laughs> I'll take a Rickenbacker, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I had a, um, a Emmons double neck, like a friend was borrowing to me. I was carrying the thing up to my flat I, I thought it was totally clear we won't get friends in the future it's like it was as heavy as a twin reverb or something right it's like crazy yeah. crazy heavy. Yeah, all, of sudden, all of a sudden you know one arm is longer than the other one. <laughs> exactly. it was really hurting it was like oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know the portability of a lap guitar is six awesome. spring lap yeah. steel great you know it even beats carrying one of these things around you know I mean, when you're touring and stuff man you know it never changed you were always trying to sneak that guitar out of the yeah. overhead you know exactly. and i this thing i'm just so lucky it never got broken you know like i had a real tight fitting gig bag and a black one and i would just hold it behind me and <laughs> really just kind of keep trying to hide it you know, and then get on that plane with that guitar, you know. Man, get into the overhead. That's how I travel. I hide my steel guitar on the side. I said I always pick the window. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a I had a ninth, I had a really early tricone. It was a round neck that I did that first album with. Yeah. Yeah. And I and, and they grabbed that from me going to New Orleans for that second festival. That was in '84 flying from San Francisco to New Orleans and it was in a case, you know, and I'm like, they took it from me and I'm like, man, I hope this thing, you know, and sure enough, they busted that thing. They must have, they must have just flat because I get to the, I get to the, I get to the French quarter where I'm staying on Royal Street. It looks okay. I open the case. It looks okay. So I got it in my, well, I lap and I'm tuning up the bass string and it's not going anywhere. So I'm Boba. I go, something's wrong. I looked down and the neck was actually separating itself from itself. Oh. It was a lateral crack so far that the neck was in shattered, you know, it was all coming up and I could see oh. daylight through the neck. Uh, I remember I remember that one, man. Yeah, and I never got anything. They didn't even pay baggage on that thing, man. Yeah, they don't they, they don't they don't take care of nothing, man. Uh, yeah, God, oh, that's why, you know, a lot of times I'll just take one of these Oriental. There you go. Ha <laughs> ha.
<laughs> and one more thing, oh. I gotta tell them. one more thing I always tell the, the young ones. It's the first thing Feet told me when I met Pete, you know, he said, you listen to your mom and dad? I said, oh no, you know, there was too strict. I moved out of the house, man, I got a ear <laughs> from him. So I tell a lot of the young players, you know, if if you they, they all want to play sweet, I said, like the feet told me, the only way you you play sweet is you have to be that. So listen <laughs> to your parents. Yeah, I mean it it involves like all about life, you know, music. Yeah, you know, I mean, see, we we uh, I'm guilty of like just being at the level that I am, but you know, when you're trying to think about. You know, I haven't had a lot of students, but when I did, you know, it, it slows me down and makes me kind of, you know, kind of step back a bit and, and just um, really try and, and make it possible for them to make it easy for them to try and figure it out because it's a fretless yeah. instrument. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you don't have this. <laughs> It's a little hard. Yeah. Um, That's why a lot of times I, I practice in the room without the light. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's when you find out, oh, man, I, man, I thought it was good. I guess not. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, you know, when you get in a real groove, you don't have to look, you know. Yeah. And I used to do, I used to sing and play at the same time, you know. Sing and play steel at the same time is a cool thing. Uh, not a lot of steel players try to handle a bunch of verses while they're playing. Well, they usually stop playing and then sing and then play, right? So you know, it's 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 cool to it's cool to mix them up, man. Yeah. <laughs> singing falsetto, Bobby. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Saul, you know, you notice on his records, he'd sing, play his ass off, go back to singing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I don't sing, man. <laughs> hey, I just noticed this look on the bridge. Foam. <laughs> I must have been recording it at the last time I took it out. I got a little foam there. You want to hear a funny story? If I, if I may indulge. <clears throat> but I don't think I told you this one, Bobby. You know, Jerry Douglas came out. And, oh, yeah. You know, Mr. Dobro, Mr. Grammy, Mr. Everything came out to Kauai and we did one with Ledward and a bunch of us. And I had this old Vega lap steel. Oh yeah, yeah. Up, up on the North shore and it sat there, it got so rusty, those strings were like just, you know, you take a steel and it go, hee, hee. it's like, oh, it's hot. So I go, where am I gonna get a, a set of lap steel strings? Nowhere, right? Not even in Kapa'a, nowhere. You're not gonna yeah. get them. And I got the gig coming up, so I go, I gotta do something. So I'm at Mike Dyer's house and I I found some steel wool. Oh yeah. I, I did. yeah, that's I that steel wool those strings so fine and I go, you know, it sounds pretty good. It's you know. So I left it like that. And I get down there for the sound check, and it's the first time I met Jerry. So Jerry's there and I'm at the sound check and he's standing at the front of the stage and I, he's, cause he was checking out the Vega, you know, it's a cool yeah. Vega. I start playing and it's going, now that it's plugged in, I didn't know, it was, I couldn't hit, hear the high ring, you know, it's going, ee, ee, making this horrible, <laughs> horrible 
super high stratospheric sound, right? Yeah. And Jerry looks at me and goes, I don't know about that boy. And I go, I go, Jerry, you're not the only country boy here. And I, I, I got a paper towel. I go, watch this. And I got a paper towel and I had driven up in Mike Dyer's old beat up Chevy pickup. I flipped up on the hood. I took the dipstick out. It was all hot from driving down up from Hanalei. I wiped it on the paper towel. I wiped the strings down. <laughs> and it got rid of the noise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it worked, man. It was like WD-40. That was funny. And the odd thing was, um, after, you know, we had a great concert and all that. So I meet Jerry Douglas. Jerry goes back to Nashville. And I had gone to high school with a guy named David Rorick, who was a great bass player. And he left around 1980 and went to Nashville and he did very well. He played with Jerry Reed, Dwight Yoakam. He ended up playing with all these guys. He did the last 10 years with Johnny Cash playing the doghouse bass with Johnny, you know? So he was very well entrenched in Nashville. <laughs> I get a I get an email from 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 David and he and he goes, hey, uh, Jerry, J Jerry Douglas came in, said he had just been in Hawaii. And, he said, and I asked him, I go, did you meet Ken Emerson? And he just started laughing. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, I met him, the guy with the, you know, oil, oiling the strings. That was funny. <laughs> Even three in one oil will work, too. <laughs> well, you got to do what you, hey, take one fish. <laughs> oh, oh. Well, just just take some pomade off your hair. <laughs> <laughs> hey, brother, side of the nose get. Yeah, side of the nose get. <laughs> oh. oh man. Yeah, a lot of a lot of these old timers I met, like one of them was my uncle, at a family reunion. He brought out his old Taisto electric guitar, had dust nice. on it, rusty strings, but he played <laughs> like. He, he played like Wes Montgomery. I, I, well, I didn't want to go on stage after him. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. You know, like they said, a lot of the old timers had five thumbs, uh, you know, because the hands were so <laughs> muscular. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's uh, limitless. I mean, I think yeah. more jazz could have been played on steel guitar. Oh yeah, but not, but not pedal steel. I I like jazz on a like a like a Rickenbacker or something. Yeah, an old oh, one. And, you you know. must know um, Benny Quizon then. I've heard of I've heard of yeah. him. Well, Benny Quizon used to play for uh, Tony Lindsay. You know that Blue Darling. Yeah. yeah. Famous, and he had like a console Rickenbacker double neck. He would put it on Echoplex. And play less Paul songs on a non pedal <laughs> Cool. Not yeah. Me, well, you know, when I played with David Paquette, I really did play a lot of jazz with him. A lot of it. Oh, I remember a gig we did in Lahaina. <laughs> it was for NBC Sports. It was like a two thousand dollar gig, right? And, and at that time, we were working with a drummer and a bass player. Yeah. And you know, us Kalahes, we're like. Hey, this is just a knockoff gig. It's a cocktail gig, you know? It's easy to go, why don't we just do it as a duo and keep the money? So I'm like, that's a good idea. <laughs> and we're all, you know, playing at the Pioneer Inn every night and getting plowed, you know? So the next day we go down there to do the sound check and play and it's like, where's my steel? <laughs> no more steel, right? So I lean over and I pick a salt shaker up off of the table in front of me because it was nice and round, you know, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, well, I, ended up playing, I ended up getting paid a thousand dollars to play a gig with a salt shaker. <laughs> hey, my yeah. first bar was a socket ranch, man. Ah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> the show must go on, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you want to hear something funny? I used to play at the, at the Princeville Hotel. And I played with Pancho Graham and, and Kirby oh, Kyo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice trio, right? And then I kind of finagled a, a, a solo gig, you know, for a while. So I'm like, oh, I think I'll bring the Nationals down and, you know, do some of that solo stuff, you know? So I had 
I had a Tricone, a Style O, I had my Martin Uke, and I had a, a six string wooden Martin or something. And I'm playing and people are sitting and enjoy it. And you know, when you play a lounge bra, you're gonna get the element now and then. And there's mm -hmm. four, there was one table out in front. Everyone's listening, you know, having a great time. And these four loud mouths, and especially the big guy, you know, guy kind of already been having some. They sat right in front of me and talked the whole time. But when it, when it and everybody was just like bumming, you know. And when they came in, he looked at me as, as he was sitting down and he said, I suppose you're going to play all those at the same time. <laughs> I went, I'm going to remember he said that. And so they were there and they, the whole set, they yacked and yacked and everyone, they didn't leave, but they were just bugged by these guys. And when they got up to leave, they were almost ready to applaud. But as they're walking, getting up to go out, I go, hey, and you know, they turn around and go, check it out. And I took the, I had the, <laughs> I had the lap, I had the tricone in my lap. I picked up and they were all tuned to G, right? I picked up the style O and use the butt end of the style on the strings and I was strumming the, the other one with my foot. <laughs> I played all three at once. That was good. <laughs> Smart ass, I got him. <laughs> There's always going to be hecklers, huh? <laughs> yeah. Hey, check this out. You can, you can still find stuff. I found this for like 15 bucks or something. It's a Vega. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a Vega. Vega pickups are happening. Very sweet little guitar. Oh, hey, Bobby, no more felt. <laughs> <laughs> no more felt. You get here. Oh, gone, yeah. <laughs> yeah, whole Vega. Yeah, the Ve Vegas are good instruments. One, one of my uncle played a Vega tenor guitar. Yeah, yeah, they're sleepers. The lap steels. Oh, maybe this is it. Yeah, here we go. This guitar, you know. I, I played Rickenbackers and I <clears throat> I settled on the EH-150 with the Charlie Christian, you yeah. know, to me that was like, that's the sound. And the, you know what, I don't know about you, but the bake lights would go out tune in my lap when they warmed up. Oh, every Or the weather. Every yeah, every so, I, and the, the, the uh, Gibson never went out of tune, so I ended up using the EH-150 for most of my lap work. Mm -hmm. And then I found this sucker and I'm telling you, man, Oh, hey, bro, get all the felt. <laughs> but this Vega here, it's yeah, yeah, it's well built, really well built. And this mm. pickup, man, can't really see it, but this is an awesome sounding guitar. And they got that <laughs> right in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, this, big, this, big red pen frying pans is the worst to go out of tune. This is like an inlaid kind of like fake ivory all the way yeah. down. Yeah. yeah, it's nice, man. Yeah, this guitar sounds just incredible. So, hey, I'm sold on Vegas, man. They're a sleeper. Get them cheap if you find one. You no, know? they're, they're, they're really good guitars, man. In yeah. fact, this, this, um, this lady, we was playing this festival in Waikiki and she said, oh, Bobby, um, I'm, I'm just like you now. I found a seven string steel. So I said, what kind? She said, I don't know, just look at it. And it was a Vega, I asked her, you want to sell it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah, no, Vegas are happening. That's a really so even, nice. Even the old National and Supros, you know, they're really sweet sounding guitars, man. Yeah. It's real sweet. Well, you know, when I was when I was touring in New Zealand back in 83, um, I found a steel in a in a like an antique store. 
yeah. and a homemade box for it, right? But it was a real quality guitar called yeah. a Commodore. And it's like <laughs> so Art Deco, man. It's all chrome and black. And the pickups got these individual poles that come out. It looks like a giant electric razor from 1930. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a crazy looking guitar. And Something the knobs like are uh, the knobs are turned sideways and sunken into the body. <laughs> right? So just the top is like that. So you can just do this like you can be stylish, bro. You can play and go, uh <laughs> with the knobs. Yeah. It's a cool guitar. Yeah. That has storage. So. And, and the thing I like about all these cool like um off brands is that um, they have a sound of their own unique tone, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, advice for, young, for, for guys that are starting out and, and trying to make strides, you know? What I, what I do is I tell them, learn, learn a, a sequence of chords that are in the same key. If you're in G tuning, okay, so... Here's G. That's a four, that's a that's a reverse slant. Is that a reverse? <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. So then you go. Yeah, you play all the G's all over the neck. So so you know it's all it's all mix and match. You know, learn yeah. variations of chords. And then you can switch around any time. And it, it, yeah. of course it goes up the scale. See, and then like C. So I would go, you know, here's a C. Yeah. Or, or C, C. Yeah. So now you got G and C and you've got how many, well, there's like four or five of them in each one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now you've got like 10 chords, you know, and then, uh, and then uh, you did the, the, the bottom first, right? So that's that. And then you got the, the high end, the same chord, C. So now you've got like um, 15, what are we up to about 15 already? Yeah, and just mix them up. Mix yeah. match, mix match, you know, to the key, yeah. just to yeah. the key. And I mean, it can be a simple, beautiful thing about Hawaiian music. Bra, <laughs> it's three chords <laughs> a lot of the time. It's yeah. not that complicated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you pick a simple, same with a twelve-bar blues, you know, just pick a yeah. simple progression, pick a simple song with a simple progression and mix match all those chords together and it just opens up opens up opens and up. you can play you can play all different beats and, and, yeah you know? e exactly yeah. What, what i really like moana chimes if you play that with the most skilled musician in the world he will totally fuck up the first time because the form <laughs> is so weird right it's awesome <laughs> some of the time some of the timing you know a lot of the hawaiians are like blues players yeah the time isn't always it's not always gonna be there'll be an added beat or two sometimes yeah a lot of times they add two beats huh bobby first yeah, time you learn you know, a hula you hear these experienced hawaiians that know the song yeah. and they'll do that two extra counts and you're yeah fuck you're fucked already you already fucked up <laughs> and, and, and i always say you know like you said same with the blues players i mean they're going to change when they feel like it. <laughs> you know, my friend did a pickup gig with John Lee Hooker. They did no rehearsal. He gets to the gig and he's, there's a crowd out there, man. He's like, what am I going to do? So he, he has the audacity to lean out toward John and go, mm. you know, like he was going to fall, like, what key are we in or what are we doing? And, like, and she said, Hooker turned around his shoulder and looked at him and said, do it like this. <laughs> do it like this. Do That's like this. Yeah, start playing. I love it. You know, I did a thing with Darlene Ahuna. She's such a great Ooh, singer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did um, Kalama Ula. 
Yeah. Look that yeah. up on YouTube, you guys. Kalama Ula and count it. I had that guy. I had this very experienced old time uh, Hawaiian bass player. And when we played the track and he was tracking, he went, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I went, yeah. 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 The change there is, uh, you know, and he went, oh, you got me. You know, he had, a, he had to go back and get that time signature down. And I still but haven't really counted it out. I don't know what that count is, but it's off. But well, you little know, the you know, come on, they like to hang on that note, right? It's, it's, yeah. for, the, it's for the singer. The show them all, you know. Change. How long are we going to be there? Make a nanny, right? That drop off right there is a perfect place to add a beat. <laughs> and it just fucks those people up so bad. Right? You know what? You know what, Ken? Like the old blues guys and the old Hawaiian guys, the time, you know, you have to listen to them, but they change when they like, they want to change, but that's what made it even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, it's like Clapton trying to tell Howling Wolf on the London sessions what to do hauling move goes oh come on man <laughs> yeah yeah hey don't think don't think just yeah play. Just don't play. think about it don't think about it i can't imagine how the you know danny kerwin and peter green you know they're all at the they're in chicago and they're all you know i mean danny was like 18 years old yeah. playing with those guys in yeah. those howling recording studio yeah. Can you just imagine? I would love to hear outtakes of that, but they pulled the it blues, off, man. The blues jam in Chicago. It was about this, you know, it was about this. I'm sure they learned a few things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You want to hear a, a classic one? I was playing with Charlie Musselwhite. I've been playing with him for a while. I thought I had had it down real good, you know, and man, that guy, those freaking guys, they, they're going to throw you one just to keep you. You're going <laughs> to play with me. You're going to have to be on your toes, right? Yeah. He goes, and you know what? It was nothing. It was easy. He leaned over to me and he said, I'm going to do an intro on the song and I'm going to come in in F on the one. When the band comes in, when he plays around one time, come in on F on the one. That's a real simple instruction, isn't it? And you can't fuck that up, right? You know what <laughs> I did? You know what I did, man? I made the fatal mistake of listening to what he was playing. And it was so brilliant and so genius and so outside the box because he wasn't an E. I couldn't tell what key if he was an E flat or B. I had no idea. And when it came to the one, I just, my guitar just went, ah, just fucking played something so fucking off. And he looked at me and I went, oh shit. Got even at me on that, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good yeah. it's all learning we, yeah. we we still learn you know we're still learning oh yeah we're, we're always learning now i'm listening to african music west you african too. Music. you too yeah you too, man. and i'm like there's no you know i saw king sunny a day and the african beats back at berkeley community theater on their first tour it was way back in the 80s and they had that guy playing that real crude uh, he played a, a a pedal steel, but he didn't play it like you know. He's he just played. He was just kind of on top of all these rhythms, doing this sustained slide work. And I go, yeah, yeah, that's really yeah. cool, you know. But there's you don't hear any more of it like that. Ooh. So I'm kind of like I'm gonna start. I'm gonna I'm gonna. That's my next branch out is to do some of those styles of music from West Africa and put the steel guitar in it. So it's, perfect. Thing, it's perfect for it. The funny thing you should say that because it was Taj the one got me into African music. Yeah. And, and it's really happy music, man. I mean, you, you can feel it. It's yeah. happy and the times, yeah. the times. Is it six, eight? Is it seven, eight? <laughs> you know? They play with the times too. Another one is Madagascar music. You know, yeah. David Lindley went there with my friend Henry Kaiser. And Madagascar music, man, the time signatures are just out. Yeah. Yeah. They're out there, man.
But I mean, it, these styles are open for Hawaiian steel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can feel it. Yeah. You know, one thing I like about Hawaiian steel, you, you can feel it into all types of music. Well, Tao Moe went to India, you know, and those yeah. guys, they got their own, they got their whole own thing now that they, and they build these guitars with all these strings and the, yeah, but they did it. They took it and they yeah. right into it. Now it's an uh, integral part of Indian music is yeah, exactly fly, fly guitar. It's great. Yeah. And wasn't there um like Pale Kelua or something? He went to uh, some weird place. Uh, in it, all, all, those guys, all those guys traveled all over. Yeah. yeah. They traveled all over and made their marks, you know. Yeah, Polly K. Lewis is a great steel player. Frank Ferrero was a great steel player. Yeah, I wanted to know, like, you know, all the collecting of the records that you did really early, I would have to assume there's a lot of uh, Frank Ferrero because it seems Lots really of it. ubiquitous. And I, still, and I still like playing that because it's, that's, you know, Bobby said sweet, you know, that, that music from that era is really sweet, you know. <laughs> All that single string stuff, you know, that little kind of a sharp attack, you pull the bar off quick. You The boat, boat days. Yeah, George, George B. Freddy's. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Ken, uh, I don't know if we have a three hour limit on Zoom or whatever. We kind of all almost hit the three hour mark. No kidding. <laughs> we, wow. yeah. well, I always really ask awesome. myself, I, I really don't want to end this whole thing, but it's like, yeah, we, I, we I'm only, hungry. We're, that's, we're, that's for sure. <laughs> we only lost half the crowd. <laughs> But you know, I, yeah. you know what? <laughs> you know, it's it's great. I mean, well, you know what's nice about that is that it shows that there's a lot of interesting things to talk about when it comes to Hawaiian guitar I mean, oh, yeah. and yeah. its influence and, and how we can keep, you know, Bobby and I, it's like we're already, man, we're we're like we're 70 so, you know, soon. And uh and you know, we're gonna have to hand it off, man. Yeah, you know, we're there. We're we're the old we're the old gray guys now. <laughs> so, you know, and then you put up some of those videos. I'm like, <laughs> what was I? I was getting all technical on you. Yeah, I'm going. Was that one take or? Uh, <laughs> are you using a couple cameras in there? Are you editing that? It's, it's fucking great <laughs> shit, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's cool, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, Tao was in Berlin. I mean, I don't know if any uh, Germans took off on the steel. You know, back in the day. Back in the day, it's a good question. I don't. I don't know. I it's think a good that, that, question. Yeah. There definitely was an opera. I think called Die Blume from Hawaii or whatever. So there, there was there was some Hawaiian themes around. And, uh, yeah, there was a play called The Bird of Paradise. Mm. And this is back in the teens, and that was worldwide popular. They toured the whole world with that thing. Yeah, The Bird of Paradise. And I think I think maybe even Kay Cooper was in on that. It was wow, pretty long ago. Yeah. And I know that there's a group in um, I think uh, in Amsterdam uh, called the Honolulu Queens. Have you heard of them? And and they're from, like that's like well, like I, yeah, we mentioned the Netherlands. It's like it's just been a, a island hotbed for because of yeah. all those immigrants from uh, Indonesia and down those islands. And, all place steel, man. Yeah, I'll tell you who one of my favorites. Have the uh, 
The Honolulu Queens right here. Nice. There yeah. you go. My favorite yeah. song from them is is called China Seas. It's such such a great song. But there's actually three songs of theirs on uh, YouTube. Uh, you can hear like it's like they're I think the only release you can hear. I don't know. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cool yeah. book, by the way. It's called Herring and Hawaii, and herring is a typical Dutch uh, seafood. So right. All about the Hawaiian scene in the Netherlands with a. Koi Pereira, George De Freitas, Rita Varane. Yeah, 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 cool. That's like I mentioned that English guy, Roland Ford. He toured the Netherlands in the 30s with a mm -hmm. Hawaiian, with a British Hawaiian, a British Hawaiian band. <laughs> yep, well, yeah. lots of bands here in, in the Netherlands. Yeah. No, that's a cool book. I'll have to look for that. Anyway. All right, Ken, Ken do you want to... Um, Let's do it again Ken, sometime. <laughs> Do you want to, uh, to end the session playing uh, another tune for us? That would be awesome. Yeah. Okay, let's see. How can I end this thing? Let's see. How about Hana Hana Hanale? Yeah. Where the famous bar was found and to be lost again. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> practice those uh, triplet chords, yeah? yeah. Like a...
All right, man. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Shave and haircut. Yeah. Take care, well, brother. Inspired me to get the guitar out. I gotta keep. You know, I, all I do is garden right now. <laughs> boulders and and cut trees and you know, operate chainsaws. <laughs> Be careful. Yeah. That's all good for finger strength, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, keep playing. And uh, you know what? It's all about the Hawaiian heart. Right That's on. what it's all about. You take care, Ken. Ken, thank you so much. And yeah, Bobby, thank, thank you so you. much. And Sebastian, you nice to meet you guys. Yeah, thanks, Sebastian. Uh, we'll do it again sometime. For sure. Shorter. <laughs> <laughs>